Ladies and gentlemen, and gentlemen welcome, welcome to, to the semifinals of the Open Rampage. rampage. Sorry, sorry, pre-made, pre-made rampage. Uh, we, uh, we, we, I, myself, I, and myself and Acolyte Acolyte. AOE. Uh, with me today, I have Doctor, and we are going to be bringing you today's semifinal action. Doctor, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. It's always a joy being on a Risen stream. And tonight, like you said, we have an absolute incredible matchup here coming in in just a couple minutes. It is the Pre-Mid Rampage semifinals here between Omega Gaming Oblivion and the Iron Chefs. Winner is going to be moving on to that grand final spot next weekend. And uh, they have one best of five between them and that opportunity. And these teams are really chomping at the bit to get started. Exactly. Omega Gaming coming in here with a 9-0 undefeated record. Iron Chefs looking to make the upset happen with a 7-2. And, and they're going to waste zero time right now as we get into picks and bans. Yeah, already coming out here. Looking at the champion pools a little bit earlier, the one thing that really stood out to me was the lack of Morgana jungle pickup. It's so strong. We are still currently on the 11-10 patch, so it's by far and away the best jungler you can pick. But... It does seem to be flying under the radar a little bit. Lee Sin, we've been seeing at MSI the entire tournament in the top lane, mid lane, just wherever people are playing it. So get that out of here. Galio and Vigar being banned away from Omega Gaming Oblivion. And they're they're targeting that mid lane. Looks like it for sure. And when we get to, you know, these high level matches, when you're at these high stakes, you know, uh, you, you definitely have that little bit of a wiggle room, if you will, to you know drop one game here or there, but it all comes down to comfort. Uh, when we have people that are in this kind of skill level, maybe not branching out and playing something you're unfamiliar with and taking a week to learn it, you know, especially when these new patches come off. I know MSI, whenever some major international tournament comes off, our solo queue just gets spanned with all these random things. I can't tell you how many rumble jungles I have seen in the past, uh, past couple months. Um, but Looking into it, you know, these guys are banning targeted bans. Uh, I took a look at the OPGGs earlier and we saw some big numbers on certain champions. I'm a little surprised that some of them snuck through, uh, but I guess the stats and the patches have dissuaded them. And with the first pick, the all important first pick, it looks like Omega is going to be going with a Scion pick. This one is screaming comfort to me. Scion is a pick that can be very easily countered. They've given Iron Chefs a lot to work with here by first picking that, but Omega Gaming are confident they can make this work. It's super strong tank-wise as well, too. One of the best currently, just full tanks that still get something done. They do have that you know nice damage behind, the, behind it in their base stats, so it's definitely pickable. Iron Chefs respond back immediately, snatching up that Morgana. It's too strong to give up. Definitely yeah. play it if you can. Yeah, there it is. Uh, we see it right away. And Morgana just has so much to offer the team. The three second route, the black shield is able to play front line with the Zanyas, is able to play back line and, and hit those bindings from afar. So one of the most versatile junglers that we see um, also, you know, when they fall behind, useful in utility. When they're ahead, you basically just get one shot, instant binding, instant death. And picking up the Tristana with the red side two pick, uh, one of those great hyper carries that just scales super well into the game, also possibly a flex. Yeah, it does have that mid flex opportunity. Technically, I guess Scion could be a flex too, both mid, top, or jungle. He's been played in all of those positions, but I don't. I don't think that's gonna happen. I think it's just in the top lane. Rumble is the jungle trade here, and. I'm a little bit concerned because Rumble is so much more difficult for junglers to pick up than Morgana. There's a lot more that you need to pay attention to. There's a lot more you need to track as the Rumble. And, you know, only a part of it is his heat gauge. The other portion is actually getting the ultimate to work. It has been, uh, it's been quoted as one of the harder ultimates to, to target in League of Legends ever since release. So it is a very strong pick, absolutely broken in the right hand but it is going to be up to OMG to make it happen. Definitely a lot to keep track of on that rumble. I can't tell you how many times I've overheated on the scrap shield, but you really got to know your limits when it comes to the damage. I mean, the auto attacks that you get when you're in the overheat mode do make a big difference. Um, but Iron Chef's going to take out the pick three before we go into the second round of bats. They're getting the Maokai. And, you know, Maokai could be flex as well. I mean, we could go tank for tank in the top lane, could also be a support Maokai. And taking the Morgana away, that does open up the ability for you to play these single target, you know, picks, uh, lock people down and layer that CC. Yep. 
Maokai also does fairly well into Scion, uh, believe it or not. You can set up the, the sapling bombs into the bushes there, and it can be really annoying for the Scion to deal with because he doesn't have any real innate sustain, whereas the Maokai, every couple of abilities or so, gets that big passive heal off. So, good strong pick. They're both just going to wet noodle each other for a while, but when it comes to these team fight engagement, Maokai has certain things he brings to the table that Scion doesn't quite match up with, and it's going to be very interesting to see how they play in around myself, or in each other. Uh, I, myself, am super curious what OMG are going to be picking up for their EV carry here. We're seeing some being banned away. Ezreal, Jinx, Senna, Corky, all in the ban phase. OMG on their last one, and I'm thinking, you know, what's available? We have Ferris available, Caitlyn. Uh, Aphelios technically, uh, Jin, like these are still available, but what are you pairing with that fresh into Tristana line? Exactly. Uh, I mean, several hyper carries. We saw Kaisa, a mainstay on the MSI tournament, just has that tank shredding ability to cut through that Scion if they're able to get those free forming auto attacks, and they will be able to get close and be a little bit more. Um, I guess hyphy would be the word that I would put down with the Black Shield and the Morgana to protect them. We'll see if they're going to look for the counter pick for mid lane. And no, that's going to be a mid lane Tristana and a bot lane Varus. So all we have left now is the support it looks like for the counter pick. Um, how do you feel about the Tristana pick in the mid lane? Without knowing the OMG mid laner, it is a little concerning because there are some picks that can kind of blow up just on a spot, but she's really safe. You know, having that rocket jump level one, level two, whatever you decide to use it, you're, you're very safe. Come over that with a flash and you really don't have much to be concerned about, especially since it's a rumble jungle. He does have the electro harpoon, but with that rocket jump, you largely can only get hit by one at a time, thankfully. So Tristana, very mobile, very safe in that scenario. The Varus, very strong in the bottom lane. Uh, we've been seeing both builds in the Risen Leagues these last couple weeks where we saw that uh, Lethality Max Arrow build and we've seen the Lethal Tempo on him build. They've both been successful to varying degrees, but I love the Silas pick here from OMG. One of the strongest mid laners you can get right now and it does so well in just about every <coughs> matchup and it just scales infinitely. So love it, love it, love it, love it. Yeah, Silas, that in-your-face mid laner, likes to get up into the middle of the fight and definitely has those middle of the fight ultimates that they could steal with the, you know, Morgana Soul Shackles, the Buster Shot, Maokai, Varus, all these big AoE CC abilities uh, to allow the Ascendant fight to go forward and allow Ash to get up and get the auto attacks off. Rounding it out with a Cho'Gath pick, so that's going to be a Maokai in the bot lane, I believe, as support, and then Cho'Gath in the top lane. But that's going to round it out. So taking a look right here, first impression, how do you feel about the team? Who's taking game one? Oh man, just who am I picking to win? Uh, I'm going off that and I'm going to say OMG to win. Outside of the Rumble, they have a very easy to execute composition. Thresh, everybody knows what that champion's going to do. Ash has her R button. Silas can steal away so many amazing ultimates from the Iron Chef squad. Scion, again, presses R, presses Q, basically done at that point. Doesn't really need to do a whole lot until the cooldowns are off, you know, cooldown and they just get to hang out and do a bunch of damage whereas the iron chef's composition here they're fairly squishy you know morgana even when she gets to that zonia's doesn't exactly get beefy tristana Varus, very squishy because they're marksmen they're not built to sustain damage maokai as a support the last time we were seeing him was because of the imperial mandate changes and that build was omega squishy like holy crap squishy you wouldn't expect it from a tree that is you know being kept alive by magic so they'll leaves just chogath to be the tank and so as a tank he gets very healthy he can build up some resistances instead of focusing on some hp bars but it's still just one champion out of five and so they're gonna have a lot of dancing around the abilities of omg to do and sometimes that can be fairly difficult so i, I like the simplicity from omg's draft yeah, I really like the the playing into the rumble composition. You know, the Morgana Black Shield is there to try to you know stop the Silas from getting on top or the Ash Arrow. All you really have to do is wait out that Black Shield, and then as soon as the cooldowns, you know, it's a 20 second cooldown at level one, and we don't really level Black Shield until we get to the later stages of the game. So as soon as that Black Shield is down, it is go button time for OMG. Uh, but the Rumble Equalizer is going to be really important, not just for the damage, but for the zoning control. I mean, with double marksmen, you want double marksmen to be able to move away, to kite, to get off those auto attacks, to get that damage off. 
and if you use that equalizer, it's going to make the maneuverability of those AD carries very difficult to execute. So as we're into the true champ select, because it was a pro draft link that we watched on stream, uh, there has been uh, some interesting, you know, come throughs already. It is going to be Silas top into the Cho'Gath with a Scion mid into Tristana. And so that one, I don't like that. I think Silas probably is a better matchup into Tristana because, you know, with the Steal Away, the Abscond of Ducks, the Kingslayer, I think that he can survive a bit better. And Scion in the mid lane, he's just not really going to have that much fun. And Rumble's not going to be of much help anyway because of the aforementioned you know, Rocket Jump. And I think I think Chugath does beat Silas if they can get to level 6 first. Uh, if Rivered gets to level 6 before Bartho Brew, then obviously he gains access to the, the Feast that much sooner, and that's a big problem. But outside of that specific scenario, I think Chugath just wins. I mean, who gets the feast first? That's kind of the big question that we see. Because um, that all in, one of the things that definitely keeps people off guard is when Silas reaches that level six, you don't have to be level six for Silas to steal your ultimate. And I can't tell you how many times that's caught me, you know, uh, blind beforehand. I'm like, what? I'm not level six. How can he steal my ultimate? But it's, it's when Silas is level six, not when you yourself are level six. So Silas does have that ability to get the early pressure. And, you know, Cho'Gath being a little bit immobile, maybe Rumble might be able to run him down, but Cho'Gath will have the ability to, you know, use those Vorpal Spikes and to use that knockup. Um, it's really going to be a battle of attrition in that top lane. Who can really survive the most? Can Silas get those heals off with that W over and over and over again? Or is Cho'Gath just going to out-sustain with that permanent push with that E and the, those Vorpal Spikes? Um, I'm Scream looking. Also, kind of just deletes Silas from the game, right? It's such a long silence ability, and so Silas, you know, if they go in with that absconded duck and just are immediately silenced, they no longer have the feast, they no longer have the Kingslayer. They're stuck there for two seconds or so, not being able to do anything. Yeah, another matchup that I'm pretty interested in is that bot lane matchup. Uh, could be pretty volatile in terms of you know when those R's come online, change the corruption, enchanted crystal arrow. Um, I mean, if that Maokai goes AP, if they're able to land their combo, because Varus can get some big damage off very quickly. He was first picked or banned at MSI for a reason because he's able to get that first damage down. Um, you know, with the three procs and uh, you know basically detonating those corruption. The blights, that's what it was called. Cr uh, detonating the blights with his abilities. So if uh, Ash steps up a little bit too far, or if Thresh isn't positioned enough correctly to kind of zone them off of that damage, I think the all in from Iron Chefs might be able to win in the 2v2, but it all comes down to execution. Yeah, I do think that this is a lethality Varus game. Uh, before we even get into it, it just seems like you would get so much value out of that build path. The bot lane is very squishy, they don't have a lot of healing, so they're not going to be able to sustain through after just getting a couple of arrows to their base. Combo that with both Silas and Rumble being squishy-ish to a, a degree. Uh, the the uh, charging arrows there really, really hurt, and you can combo those with a dark binding spam as well, a sapling spam, and it's just going to be a lot of dodging on the side of Omega Gaming, and then as soon as they do get hit by either that dark binding or they're incredibly low, you can have like a chem take Cho'Gath just come flying in out of nowhere, land a rupture, land a silence, whatever it is, and then you just overwhelm the side of Omega Gaming Oblivion and just take the objectives off of that. So I think that, that would be the best route. We'll see if that's actually what happens, but I, I mean... I like Omega Gaming's comp better than Iron Chef's, but I see how both teams have victory conditions. I definitely agree. It's also nice about the Lethality Various that you mentioned is, you know, you don't have to sacrifice that DPS because you have that Scaling Tristana in the mid lane, so you can't afford to go that poke build because you still have that persistent DPS available on the side of your team. But will it be enough to shred through, you know, the, the Scion in your face? Can they survive the the all-in, in-your-face comp that we mentioned beforehand. It's going to be a doozy, I can tell you that, as uh, we're counting down into game one. And I believe in the chat we should have some kind of pull available for you guys. So who do you guys think is going to come out on top? Make sure you let us know as we count down and get into game one.
Take a moment right here Feeling like a sound gear Driving towards the sun With a rose and a gun Feel the wind in my head Going nowhere I swear Lying out on the run Dangerous but it's so fun Running, running the blue side we have omg with rivet on the top lane on silas egg rolls with rumble in the jungle carito on Sion mid snake doctor on the ash and i Jone, i probably butchered that on thresh in the bot lane on red side we got barth the brew on the chogoth in the top king tayhole on the morgana Timmy on the tristana spartan monkey on the varus and my friend told me to on the iron chefs and it looks like a pretty standard start solo queue wise on the buffs yeah, both teams are going to be prepared to just do the normal thing. It's Morgana and Rumble, so they clear very quick. So we will be able to see that in just a couple seconds. And I do th think that it makes sense in a way to actually target this top side a little bit from both sides, right? Silas can take over games so quickly and so nonchalantly once they start getting ahead. So you either want to shut that down if you're king to hole or you want to get that going if you're egg rolls. So with them both starting on the bottom side of the map here, it Ooh. makes sense that they're going to end up top. It'll just be who gets there first. And that's where the practice between these two junglers comes into play. Who's going to be more comfortable? Is it the Morgana player or is it the Rumble player? And talking about that top lane matchup, Silas going down about 200 HP very early. And, you know, Timmy on the Tristana, you talked about Sion not having a fun time. I mean, Tristana's already putting down work top side again. Uh, there's just skirmishing all over the map right now. Um, something else you mentioned a little bit earlier was the Maokai build. Is he going to go tank or is he going to go that squishy mandate build? And it looks like it's mandate taking the uh, comet option. Yeah, I, I do think that that's one of the main reasons you pick this Maokai support is because you can get a lot of damage, but they are going to lose that level two which does make it a little bit difficult, but you still have that super long range arrow. So you're not that concerned about farming from distance, but Barthobrew going very low in the top side there. But overall, just trading back and forth. And I mean, he's, he's Chogath, he's gonna heal up again. As Silas looking for the cheater recall, but doesn't get the lane all the way pushed in. So he's gonna lose about a wave of experience right now, walking back to lane. A little bit of a misplay from uh, Rivered. But we see a big hook on the bot side, lands on the Spartan Monkey. Pretty good damage so far. I do think that you are a couple seconds ahead of us here. Um, but I'm sure we'll be able to excitingly see that Thresh hook in just a couple seconds. But for now, they are just uh, farming away. Both teams trying to get something going. Carito, I did see some people in chat saying that this was a free win because Carito was on the Scion. They're undefeated up until this point, but it just feels like such an odd pick in the current meta. Yeah, definitely a little strange. Uh, help me get synced up with you guys here. I'm currently at almost four minutes. Uh, 
are at 332, 333, 334, 35. Okay, just let me know when you get to four because we got some big action coming for you guys. I won't spoil it just yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right now, I do see from the jungler perspective, uh, both of them have full cleared their jungle with the exception of the Gromp on blue side. And they are going to be looking to pick up these crabs in the bottom, but here comes a gank, and we're at 356, 357, 58, 59. All right, both carries going very low. We see Varus go down, but he gets the return kill onto the Thresh. Double flash onto Snake Doctor. He's going to live by the skin of his teeth. Gets the last auto and takes down the Maokai. Wait, teleport coming from Carito, but he is there. And the Tormented Soil not going to be enough to take down the Ash, who is zoned off momentarily. Auto attacks take down the Ash. And just before he could save him, uh, Carito picks up the kill for himself. Explosive fight in the bot lane. That was insanely close. My friend missing the auto attack and hits the minion instead is what allowed them to stay alive. Snake Doctor taking full advantage of that second miracle life they were handed to. And they stay alive long enough that the teleport can connect. They get the trade kills. They come out super far ahead here. It's two kills already onto the Ash. And you can see right away the difference in items we even have a bounty on the side of snake doctor already that is huge four minutes into the game yeah definitely a uh, pretty explosive action we see a lot of summoners bone bear is still having both summoners available so they do have those combat summons we'll see if they are going to take advantage of those no flashes does a cleanse oh no and we see a Lantern trying to get him off Rumble, flashes forward on a Spartan Monkey, but he's able to flash out with those summoners. And then here we see double TP coming from both top laners. Chogoth forced to run away immediately. River goes forward, gets the knock of awesome, and the second follow-up of the Q damage takes down the Chogoth. Return kill on to the Morgana with its fermented soil. Another two for one win for OMG. The amount of crowd control that they have right now is just too much to handle. It's so easily connected. It's so hard to get out once it does finally connect. And you saw that Bartha Brew came in, immediately had to leave. And they just simply weren't able to because of the Abscond Duck there from River. Locked him down, allowed the rest of the crowd control from Iharajan to connect. And they just they just closed it out from there. They have the damage because they have Rumble early game. They have the CC from what everything I mentioned. And there's just nothing a level 5 Cho'Gath can do. They have a Bramble Vest and that's it. Yeah, that's pretty interesting when you TP and then you immensely have to run away. Another big thing that happened for them as well is River gets the kill, Cho'Gath does not. And look at all that farm. He has about two waves stacked up in the top side where Cho'Gath lost the, the most of that. So Silas going to get the experience lead. And this is where we see that Silas take off like we mentioned in the in the pregame. Yeah, and the Bramble Vest is there to try and stop some of that healing from the Kingslayer. It, it's so crazy how much health he can actually get back, and whereas Bartho Brew does have some healing in regards to the Chogath passive, it's not nearly as constant or as explosive as the Kingslayer heal can be. So it's trying to cut some of that a little bit, but I mean, Silas is running the Conqueror as well, so it's like, why even? It's almost to the point where why bother, right? Because <laughs> like, uh, anti-heal items just they don't they don't do anything. Oh Tame, the huge Yes, dodge. Scion going for the ultimate on the mid lane, forces the flash out of Tame, but we see Scion starting to get those levels. And looks like Rumble might be getting caught out. The Buster shot knocks him out of the dark binding. He's trying to turn it around with the harpoon. But Karito a little slow to get there to join him. Rumble biting off a little bit more than he can chew, looking for those enemy raptors. Yeah, I mean it's into Morgana. One binding it didn't connect, but the threat of a binding should be enough, I think, to deter Rumble at this point, especially now that Tristana is going to be able to go back to base, start building up towards that next item. Uh, you know, it does have 700 gold right now, so they're, they're still a little short of being able to pick up their quiver, but with that farm wave and going back to the base, they should have just enough, I imagine. And it's pretty interesting when you think about that you know Tristana with the um with the E should have auto push on the lane 100 percent of the time uh you know a little bit scared of the Scion actually blowing that flash you think Tristana would have the prio in order to kind of push the rumble out of their their own jungle um but you know, pretty interesting we see a thresh roam at the very early stages of the game he did he walk over a word I, I wasn't 100 percent sure if his pathing there but we see a uh, 1v1 right here tormented or black shield on the Morgana sees him escape. And we're just going to cool off for a second. 
that King Toho had used the, that is, Thresh, not visible. Good flash. A great flash right there from Bartha Brew. You know, Thresh finding that gap in the minion wave. He did miss quite a bit of uh, experience, but Ash was able to catch up to a lot of it. And that's pretty much how the meta goes. You know, the ADC just kind of stays bot lane and soaks up the solo XP, tries to accelerate their their leveling, and you know, Thresh or any support for that matter just has to go around and make some plays happen. Yeah, I think that it's a little tough to see though, right? Because Ash isn't super safe by herself, so she does need to give up a little bit. And so, like you said, that gap's been closed by Spartan Monkey just enough to make them come in fairly equal uh, but we are going to get that lethality build from spartan monkey and i'm not a huge fan of the halo blades here i think if you're running lethality varus the dark harvest can really really kind of spike your damage quite nicely so a little sad not to see that we are seeing dark harvest on both junglers though so that is going to come into play a large margin i'll give you guys a soul count in just a second we do have two on the egg rolls and three actually on the king to hold there so Starting off fairly strong, actually, for junglers, getting those numbers before 10 minutes. And definitely the junglers, it, it was pretty scrappy in the early game. We saw some very explosive early game fights, you know, pre-10 minutes. So accelerating those Dark Harvest stacks. Uh, something I kind of want to point out is, you know, Scion's starting to reach this critical mass point where Timmy is not able to keep up with uh, the damage that he's putting out or put enough pressure on Kurito. I mean, he just walks up uses the shield, uses the empowered Q, and then just clears pretty much the entire wave. Uh, so Timmy's trying to put some damage down, but that Bramble Vest is kind of equalizing everything. Meanwhile, on the top side, River steals away the ultimate from the Cho'Gath, goes all in, and takes him down for his own feast. Meanwhile, on the bot side, we see a huge equalizer go down. Sion a little late to join the party. Double flash, Spartan Monkey able to get away, but two very big kills on the side of OMG, right when this dragon's about to spawn. That was a really great equalizer too. I said it in champ selects that those can be kind of daunting for players that may not have a lot of practice on them, but that one layered perfectly. It even just the tip of it got onto Spartan Monkey, so had to burn the flash there to May getting aggressive here. Yeah, Rocket Dogs forward gets the reset using the empowered E. We see a flash forward from Egg Rolls and Timmy with no jump, no flash. He is dead looking for the solo kill on Carito. And Iron Chest falling pretty far behind in this early game, a 3,000 gold deficit as OMG looks to take their second dragon of the game. And a lot of the gold is going right where it needs to. You have two kills onto the, each of the top two players here, River and Egg Rolls. You have three kills onto Snake Doctor. That is exactly where you want that gold. Scion, tank, doesn't need gold. Thresh, support, doesn't need gold. It's funneling to the carries, and they're making great use of it. You can already see the pickaxe there in the hands of Snake Doctor. They're going to be able to build their Mythic the next time they go back. Uh, and I'm curious which one they get, um, because I've seen a couple different options on Ash. The pickaxe means it's not going to be the Immortal Shield Bow, so it is going to be either the Gale Force or the um, Kraken Slayer. Uh, yeah, so... I'm curious, I think Gale Force is actually better here. It gives you that little bit of movement uh, ability. It does help you take out some of the squishy members. And the only tank here is Bartho Brew, who you can actually use that Gale Force to dodge out on the rupture. So I think that makes a lot of sense here. And Timmy dodging out the skills on the mid lane and trying to keep that pressure down. But Sion again can just pretty much AFK farm in the mid. We see a gank from King Tehol. He's looking for the binding. And Carito with the fancy feet is able to dodge the dark binding. And Morgana struggling to make some plays. Had some two kills at an early advantage, more being you know one of the strongest carries in the game right now from the jungle perspective, but finding it difficult to stay involved. Yeah, it has slowed down quite a bit, and it's because the times they do get involved, it's odd numbered, and so they're actually easily, you know, beaten back by just the number game that OMG is bringing to the table. Ooh, big hook on the mid lane. It's going to go right into Scion's decimating smash. A flash from Timmy sees him stay alive, but another big summoner spell extended. But here we see River going forward, uses the change to latch onto Bartha Brew, has the feast. Looking to uh, solidify his kill. Big equalizer trying to zone them off of the tower. Doesn't hit most of them, but they are weak and they're going to be pushed back. Enchanted Crystal Arrow from across the map does not land on anyone. And it looks like it's just going to be pressure and plates for the side of OMG. 
Bartha Brew was very nearly in feast range, which is the stolen ability at the moment. So just playing with fire by hanging around that turret, they recognize it, they fall away. It just means more plate gold slash potentially the Rift Herald here being picked up for OMG. It is past the 10 minute mark, so it's not guaranteed plate money. And because it's 13 and a half minutes, they have literally 30 seconds to take the Herald and get it to crash into the tower if they want plate. But there's four people here, so that might actually happen. Yeah, it is a little bit of a rush. Timmy, knowing that the Rift Herald being taken pushes and backs off, does not greed for those plates. So very smart play by him. And it's just going to be kind of more of the same. We're going to see Silas on the Cho'Gath again and again and again. Just, you know, on rotation, on cooldown, just getting up in his face and putting down the pressure. We see about a 30... 30? Yeah, that's about 30 minion CS lead on the Silas. Sion with about 30 himself. So just across the map, it doesn't even just have to be kills. It's just CS-wise, uh, OMG outclassing Iron Chefs in game one right now. Yeah, I mean, the thing, the only thing that Silas has to worry about is their mana pool. And with that tome already, they just they can ignore it. Every time they level up, they get a bunch of mana back. And we see the Soul Shackles landing onto two of them. Morgana with a great blast cone, penalizing uh, the Thresh for looking for that pink ward. And just like that, a quick double kill onto the Varus with that Lethality build. Uh, that's going to be pretty big to soften them up before these fights happen. Yeah, there was the shutdown that went over to King Tahol as well. Tim A trying to get out, but down to half HP and barely did anything to Kurito. And that's that's a that's a problem, just full stop. Tim A needs to be their main DPS output. And right now they're being you know hampered by just being a marksman. They just don't have the power to compete right now. They're being constantly shoved in. You would have loved to see them be able to roam out. And this was a first pick Scion. So, you know, we, for the most part, assumed it was going to be going topside. And I think OMG made the right call and actually swapping it. I wasn't a huge fan of it originally, but it's clearly worked out. Yeah, if Timmy's not able to get those early kills on there, because of that Scion passive, getting that, you know, extra health uh, from the passive abilities, it makes that armor so much more effective. And so if Timmy is not able to really abuse him levels, you know, one through three or four, then it becomes a very big issue and almost an unstoppable force uh, for him to kill. Meanwhile, we see uh, dragon number three is going to be coming up. It's going to be an ocean dragon, so an ocean soul for this game. And we may be looking at a very early dragon soul uh, if the teams posture up for it. Yeah, I think right now, with all of the Mythics being completed on the side of OMG, I don't see a world where Iron Chefs can actually compete for the third dragon. I think they have to just give it up and sell everything in terms of getting ready for that fourth and final dragon of the soul. But look at their map position. They are fully planning on competing for this. Ooh, River has a teleport slink. and may take the tower. Thresh lands the hook. Uh, they get the Scion ultimate out very early. Oh. Timmy! Goes in with a rocket jump and just face takes the rumble flames. Meanwhile, we see uh, them on the dragon rumble taking it up, but we see Rivered on the back line going onto the Maokai split fights in both directions. Eagleizer is a big whiff, but Dark Doctor goes down to the Cho'Goth rupture. So far, it looks like it's a three for one and a big shutdown from the various from downtown. With the arrow, he gets a shutdown for himself and they're going to turn on the dragon. And looks like OMG is just going to give it up. They put down the Rift Herald on the mid lane, so looking to get some mid pressure out of this. Yeah, they are going to. Are they going to fight the GPG? Yeah. Smite, pretty strong, 900 damage. Not even going to be able to close out on the tower, so that's a huge win for the Iron Chefs. They got that nice snipe at the end from Spartan Monkey to get the shutdown. Oh, the tower did die eventually, so. Yeah, second charge ended up going off too, and you know, just taking a look at that earlier fight, it was just so spread out. I mean, River was just in the middle of people doing his own thing. Uh, you know, big miss on that Rumble Equalizer, didn't really take down anyone. Snake Doctor, you know, has to kite out of his mind because there are a lot of skill shots he has to dodge. He has to dodge the Rupture, has to dodge the Dark Binding, has to dodge Change of Corruptions. So, you know, being up into the middle of that fight, going down the carries, not being able to do carry things. So uh, OMG got to tighten up their team fighting a little bit if they want to keep this lead nice and secure. Still about a two and a half thousand gold lead, but uh, Iron Chefs do buy themselves a little bit of time when it comes to this dragon stacking. Yeah, I was going to say, I do still think overall that fight is still a net win for uh, Iron Chef. Oh, River found him. 
uses the Everfrost to put him down. He does have the chains available. And here is Thresh yet again on the roam, looking for the big plays. Gets the death sentence to pull him back. And Chanted Crystal Arrow just barely misses. Rupture gets the knockoff, but it's just too little too late. Actually, there's the Black Shield and a big Soul Shackle is going down. We see the chains of corruption. I'm thinking of the wrong champion, but Rivered is ignited and going backwards on trying to. Whoa, he didn't <laughs> see the sapling! He didn't see it right next to him. He just blows up and big kills right there for the side of Iron Chef's a two for one on a turnaround of what took them in it feels like an eternity to take down that Joga. Yeah, Bartha Brew is starting to get really tanky at this point. You know, has the completed Merc Treads, is just piecemealing items together, but they have a Cho'Gath, so that's a lot of HP stacking that they've got for themselves. Takes forever for the top support to be able to take that kill, and it gives enough Bro. time. Oh, that first on the Equalizer, yeah. He gets him down, uh, uses that Night Harvester to uh, use that initial damage. Look at Timmy flashing forward or jumping forward onto the Snake Doctor, gets the reset and the Buster Shot, jumps back out. Great pick from Timmy right there in the top side. Iron Chefs, they're willing to scrap. They are not going to roll over in game one. Now, things are starting to look a lot better for them. They're getting money onto their carries. We're seeing the 3 1 Varus. We're starting to get some kills there onto Timmy as well. Uh, also, King to hold up 4-1 now so really really coming back strong does have two items completed the zonias and that leandry so big power spike for them and this oh man, this this very is gonna hurt me this is just oh power of law i've i've heard about it in the solo queue i've seen it in a couple streams I, I always thought it was a little bit of a meme um i don't know can you offer a little bit of insight into that actually we have a scion ultimate in the top lane finds bartha group in the bush, the Rupture's going to knock up Carito and Barthi are going to try to walk away, but he lands the follow-up knockup. There is no secondary cavalry on the back. Barthi trying to trade back, but you're not going to win this fight, man. You got to just get out. Gets the grass of the Undying Proc, gets the knockup, is going to be able to lock out Maokai on the way up to answer, but I don't think they'll have the damage to take him down, even if it's a 2v1 with those kind of champions. Yeah, I mean, for the most part, that's just a white noodle fight. Bartho Brew, yeah, they took a good amount of damage, but they just have to hang out of the tower and catch the wave, and they should be back in good shape, I imagine. Ooh, King Tail forced to flash out. Yeah. They flashed. They didn't believe. Didn't believe in themselves. I mean, I, I could definitely see that if you're uh, the other person and you don't trust, uh, you know, your teammate to get you the black shield, but you know, not trusting yourself right there. Uh... Yeah, a little bit of an unnecessary expenditure. Uh, we see the Ocean Dragon coming up again in about a minute, and the gold is pretty much equalized from the early parts of the game, just OMG not taking the appropriate fights. Yeah. Going back to your point about the, the Prowler's Claw and my insights on it, the only thing I can think of is that because so many members of OMG want to just sit on top of Spartan Monkey that they can use it as a bit of a repositioning tool Plus it gives you the damage boost once you do finally connect with it So they then try and burst out either rivered or egg rolls potentially um, Kurito is at a point where they just never have to fear Varus because it is lethality So it's up to Tame and King to hole to really take out Kurito, but I'm just I just don't think it's uh, ideal here in this game um, I, I'll wait. I'll hold judgment because there is, like, we haven't seen it actually do anything yet. So first team fights here. Yep, big flank from the side. Gets the teleport, forcing the flash out of Spartan Monkey and the change of corruption. Meanwhile, on the other side, Malkai and Chugga get that big flank and that's a shut down onto the Rumble. And Timmy jumps forward again in the Snake Doctor who's able to take him down with the Thresh. And we see fights on both sides. Bartha Brew gets the feast onto the carry, but here comes Varus just free hitting. And so far, it is a three for two in favor of IC. They're going to knock him down. King Teho on a rampage gets his fifth kill of the game, secures that one with the Dark Binding. And that's the power pick of the Morgana with the Soul Shackles and that spacing ability. So, Prowler's Claw. I'm going to wait till next team fight because it, it wasn't even used this time. But no, Tame, very aggressive on that Tristana. As long as Tame can trade one for one for Snake Doctor for the next couple fights, then I see you're actually in a pretty strong position because to kink the hole so far ahead at this point, five, one, and seven on this Morgana, they can really start to carry these team fights with just the straight magic yeah. damage. Because when you look at the tank of uh, OMG, they don't have a ton of magic resist. They do have the Negatron Cloak with the Mercury Treads, which 
largely is there for the tenacity, but they don't have any damage either. So as long as you don't get hit by Karita's crowd control, they're pretty ignorable for the most part. But Snake Doctor, Egg Rolls, Rivered, and uh, Ahojan, uh, they just kind of melt in front of the Morgana if they get hit by a Dark Binding. So Timmy takes out Snake Doctor. The rest of the team fight just kind of slides into place at that point. They win the fight. They win the dragon. And all of a sudden, they're threatening to go on to Soul Point in the next couple minutes, which would be four Ocean Dragons. That is one of the most powerful dragon situations you can collect for yourselves. And definitely being able to survive these fights, especially um, it's not too much burst damage coming out. You know, it's the extended fight. Silas being able to get the Kingslayer repeated again and again. Uh, Rumble being able to get multiple flame spitters off and Snake Doctor being able to get the fight off. So it just feels like they don't really have the burst to take them down, or maybe they're just not utilizing it correctly because we've seen this is the second fight that Iron Chefs have won, but it's because they're splitting up the team fight. It's because they're taking instead of a 5v5, there's 2v2s and 3v3s and they're all over the place. And, you know, Tim A falling behind a little bit early, like you said, if he's able to go one for one and take down that early game carry that was the Ash, then it's definitely worth it. Yeah, I mean, ideally you need, or you would like Timmy to stay alive after getting the kill, um, but it's not the end of the world right now if they die. In a couple of minutes, when Morgana starts doing a bit, little bit less damage and magic resist starts coming into play, it might be a little bit more of a concern, but for now, that's fine. Timmy, like I said, they'll cool off in a couple of minutes, they'll start being that tank buster that you expect Tristana to be, but I'm curious what the goal here for the teams is. is Timmy, trying to play around this Ooh. tower, yeah, Rivered was looking for the dive, and Timmy plays around it very well. Rivered going to be able to get out with the help of the Blast Stone, and we're going to see another fight that may be split up. OMG trying their best to group together a little bit better. Lands a death sentence onto the Varus, using the Chains of Corruption. He's going to blow up almost immediately. Silas with a big shutdown. Meanwhile, we see damage coming all over the place, and Soul Shackle is huge in the middle. Timmy going to stay alive, but Carito is trying to get on him as well. King Tejo lands the knockup or the Dark Binding onto Carito takes him down. Big win right there again for Iron Chefs. I believe that is a three for two yet again. And they just can't clump up for the King Tailhole. They can't win the 5v5. They can't win the 2v2 or the 3v3. So now they got to start getting a little creative. That was almost best case scenario, right? Like you have a rumble in the jungle with a perfect lineup for your uh, equalizer and it still wasn't enough to melt down pretty much anybody except the bot lane here which is super spartan monkey they're an eighty carry they're, they're just gonna melt in front of everybody and then my friend who is the uh mandate maokai so not exactly super tanky so those being your only sacrifices and tim a is able to stay alive just barely thanks to the help of king to holes soul shackles means that the fight is able to turn around and we get to see that tank busting opportunity from Tame after you know Karuto was not allowed on top of them and just give him enough time to cut him down they have that lord dominix there it's going to be a problem for omg and it's gonna be something they need to fix catching spartan monkey is great because it removes a big piece of damage from the pie but you also need to get Tame. and rivered recognized that they did 80 percent of Tame's health bar in damage in like three hits so they recognized what they needed to do but the soul shackles was too quick and River trying to get onto that back line. Um, going third item, it looks like he's going to be looking for the Hourglass. He does have that stopwatch available, so he should be able to extend those fights out, maybe survive those soul shackles, and be able to get those multiple rotations of spells off. But yet again, Dragon coming up in 30 seconds, and we're going to be going towards the third Drake. Pretty much dead even on gold. If you would have asked me we would be at this situation at 27 minutes of the game, I would definitely not have predicted this so far. Uh, let's see, push into the mid lane, takes down the tower, but they're just posturing around it. And it looks like the fight's going to take place before the dragon spawns. Shogoth has a flanking opportunity. Spartan Monkey trying to get that poke off, but now they're just kind of playing chicken right now. And this is working. This is the lethality of Eris and what they do. They're just throwing saplings and bindings and arrows into the void. If they connect, great. If they don't, just do it again in a couple seconds. And you're seeing that they're not ready to pull the trigger here on OMG's side. They're posturing, but they haven't done it yet. Yeah, and with this being the third dragon, no one wants to be the one who has to take a bad fight because of Soul Point. But look at that poke yet again. The thresh goes low, and 
Tyler's just using that Maokai ultimate preemptively, but they're going to move up to the Baron, and we'll see if they have the damage to take this down. I don't know if they're going to be able to do it. We'll see. Ash does have the Kraken Slayer, and that's pretty much it in terms of percentage HP uh, burn, but here we see the fight coming. Scion doing his best to zone off. We see the Enchanted Crystal Arrow comes out early to oh, keep the huge. Morgana away. That is huge. And Kurito trying to get away, but here comes a flash forward from Barthabrew. Huge knock up on it, too. They take Kurito down early, and there goes the front line. Kurito doing his best to cause chaos and damage, but one kill for Baron, I think that'll be worth. Yeah, it was the perfect equalizer there. My friend, a uh, little aggressive there. I, I respect the opportunity, but uh, you gotta wait for your friends in the end. But Tame is gonna get yeah. hooked up. Oh no. I think they lands the Dark Binding, and then the tower aggro moves on to Barthagru, who is able to take it up, and they get the knockup onto the Rumble, so they end up getting two more after that Baron play. Not able to weave under tower. You think tower keeps you safe? My friend, I have some information for you. You are dead wrong. So pretty even trade in terms of, you know, three kills for the Baron for gold. Um, you do see them on that Ocean Soul point for the Iron Chefs, and it's still pretty much anyone's game. Yeah, I think Iron Chef ultimately went out there. Yes, they lost the Baron and the mid lane tower, but they got that third dragon in a row, which means they have now three oceans. They're already gaining seven and a half percent missing health every five seconds, which is huge. That is so much HP for just about everybody on the team. They get the three members down to take away the Baron, which really, really lessens that split push potential that OMG would have been able to open up and they're getting more and more gold onto their own carry. So it's becoming very noticeable that OMG are fight adverse. I mean, they could have used that Maokai ultimate to, you know, get something going comboed with the Scion ultimate at that third dragon. They chose not to. They chose to go for that Baron play. And then as soon as it got the Baron, they scattered into the wind. And I love that I, I see we're so ready to just chase. Most teams, I think, once they're sitting on that equalizer and run, watching the enemy team run away, I think they'd be like, all right, cool, we just have to survive the next couple minutes. And instead, Iron Chef just go, nah, we're gonna fight. We're gonna kill you, and we're gonna take that off of you. And yeah, we thought that was a little interesting. Not like going a little bit early, but you saw the intention was there to make it happen. And, you know, like we said, Iron Chef's scrapping their way back into this game. And I mean, you can see it uh, in their in their team fighting. They're just doing excellent. They're landing their skill shots. They're doing what they got to do. And OMG, they you know very very slim gold lead, but it was it was on them to make it happen. Could you imagine if they had the Ocean Soul into the Poke Bears? Or that would have been you know huge if they were able to take down those dragons. But River goes forward, steals the feast, and we might see something happen around the top lane. It's awkward waiting position for the rest of the minion wave to get there as rumble pushes in that mid wave we may see a fight in the jungle uh huge for rumble and morgana to get those fights in those jungle choke points because of that equalizer and because of that soul shackles so it's going to be very difficult for these teams to navigate the drains for both sides yeah and the siege potentially here from omg is actually really tough they only have that like one and a half range champions and ash and thresh and Ash not exactly the longest ranged marksman in the game, so just trying to get the most usage out of this Baron buff, but it largely doesn't doesn't get a whole lot done. And the chase now coming through. Baron buff has expired, and it's just a minute until the next dragon, which it's either going to be Soul or Iron Chef, which is huge. I, I think that actually ends the game for the most part. Like, yes, OMG could still win fights potentially, but it's so much more difficult when you have to like out damage Ocean Soul. I know, you have to get your spells on rotation again and again and again. If you don't pop people right away, then that Ocean Soul is just gonna see them come back twice as big and you don't get to siege. You don't get to put down the towers because they just come right back. So it just makes it that much difficult for them to execute. They're gonna have to get very creative with their positioning, with their vision and get some kind of pick early on in the game to kind of secure their victory or their path to victory. 30 seconds and we see the vision battle going on. King Tejo able to sweep one of the wards. There's still another one just on the other side of the blue buff and now it's pretty much a game of chicken. Can Varus get all of those uh, cues off and get that poke down? Tejo throwing his shots. We see a death sentence land onto the Maokai with the equalizer and Maokai burning right away. 
pretty much before the fight even starts, he's able to walk away. Big Rue onto the Varus, but they're going to turn onto the Cho'Gath on the backside. And are they going to empty all of their damage into him? Yes, they are. You see, Chains of Corruption is going to land on most of them. Frito going forward to split the fight up, and he's going to buy some time. And Channel Crush the Arrow splits the difference. But they see Timmy gets caught in the middle, and King Slayer, our Snake Doctor, takes him down. And that's a huge win for OMG as they delay the Soul Point. Another dragon. They bought themselves about five minutes. Yeah, the team was just too split on the side of Iron Chef. You, oh. oh, River goes in, flashes onto the Varus, gets the root. He's going to stay alive. King K. Ho with the Soul Shackles goes golden, but River's going to take him down. Huge fight from OMG. Yeah, the Silas is really coming into their own now. Very hard to kill and does a ton of damage off the back of it too. And again, that fight started because Iron Chefs was two split. Cho'Gath was all the way in that uh, Riverside Bush entrance there. They were all by themselves. And the rest of the team from Iron Chef were in odd spots over by the blue buff. And you can see it took them like a good five seconds to even get over to that team fight. You had Spartan Monkey throwing arrows over the wall, but their lethality varies and we're 35 minutes into the game at this point. There's been armor built by most of the other teams. So you're not doing a whole lot with just arrows anymore. And they just had enough damage between the entire team on the Bartha Brute, took him down, was able to turn nicely, even with that Enchanted Crystal Arrow just splitting the uprights, catching to May with the Upsconded Duck, ends the fight. They didn't have any way to escape. They were, I believe they were down Rocket Jump. They might have used it aggressively to try and get into the fight. I, I don't remember exactly, but it took, regardless, they got caught, exploded, dead, and that gave up the dragon. And then them hanging around instead of just recognizing that the dragon pusher is over and going back to the lanes means they then also lose King T Hole in a one for one with Snake Doctor. Yeah, it's really difficult with a double AD carry comp if your front line is not in the front. So a big pick from OMG onto the Cho'Gath saw them, uh, you know, saving that soul. And next dragon is going to be Ocean Soul no matter what. So that's going to be a big fight that we're looking forward to. The Baron is up. We see vision from both teams on it. So right now they're just kind of playing the vision. And I don't know what we'll see in the next several minutes if they're going to try to take an early fight. Carito stepping pretty far up, putting some damage on, on the Bartha group, but the rest of his team not able to follow up on damage. So pretty brave of him to step up like that. But, you know, not having a vision on that rumble means that they uh, don't want to take a fight that they are not prepared to take, especially with the equalizer being so deadly on those jungle ramps. Ultimate call once again. Yeah, the Enchanted Crystal Arrow on the Snake Dog. I don't even think Karito got an assist on that one. But Timmy just gets caught away from his team. And look at that. Uh, the Maokai Ultimate Soul and Roots are going both directions. That's you can just follow away to the Baron here. Yeah, they're just going to fall away to this Baron. But River catches Cho'Gath yet again. And Cho'Gath is in a pretty precarious spot. King Tejo lands the Q, puts the Shoal Shackle down, but is only able to land up on one. And River goes golden, but they take him down. Uh, equalizer over the side, but the team not going to be able to follow up. A rolls and Snake Doctor are on the Baron, and the rest of the team is fighting. They have to make a decision as a team. A rolls trying to solo the Baron now, but Carito playing the front line one v four. Basically, Lantern is down, but he's not going to be able to take it out. And Iron Chefs, they, it looks like they had a huge pick at the very beginning. It looks like they were just going to fall apart, but. They follow up the fight, they secure the kills on the two members of OMG, and they're going to take the Baron as their prize. And yeah, it's another split call coming in from OMG. They had the initial kill there on the Tame. They landed the Enchanted Crystal Arrow, got the 1-0, you know, solo kill, and then they, you know, forced into the, the jungle there, and they were like, all right, fall back. They, we got the ultimate out of them take the Baron. And you saw Egg Rules and Snake Doctor were on the same page, and it was the other three members that were not on the same call. They went for the pick on the Bartha Brew because they had him on a ward, but it's Cho'Gath! You need Ash there to be able to kill him, and you could see immediately that there was not going to be enough damage before the rest of Iron Chef were going to be able to show up. They show up, they deal their own damage, even with a beautiful equalizer onto every single member of Iron Chef. They just tanked through it, kept putting out the damage, they started picking up kills, and with Egg Rolls and Snake Doctor so very low from the Baron, they couldn't trade back at that point. They had to just fall away. They give up the Baron for basically free. All you do is lose Timmy for it, who, uh, let's look at the map, uh, actually has Baron. They spawned in time, so they have the Baron buff as well. And with the Ocean Soul coming in the next 40 seconds, uh, you know, this is kind of a game of chicken. Death timers are very long. Um, Ash doesn't have that turret destroying power, so, you know, they're not going to trade a base race for that. 
we see I see um, have the position so far. They have the vision. They are there first. So they are forcing Rivered and Egg Rolls and Credo and the rest of OMG to move into them. Dragon Soul and another 20 seconds. But, you know, their position for the team fight, Credo looking for that flank with the ult. This is looking very similar to two dragons ago when I see were able to set up and just poke away. But, oh, that's huge! Snake Dogs are forced to cleanse! Yeah, big damage, and Bartha Brew stepping up to put down some damage as well, and Malkai gets a shutdown onto the Ash. Must have been a sapling kill, but that was huge. Snake Doctor's health bar just got deleted with that Dark Binding. Yeah, that's, that's the main danger. The poke from IC is too much to deal with, especially when you don't have any dragons, right? You, you have the one ocean at 2.5% HP every 5 seconds, but now you've given up 4. You gave up four Osh Dragons. It's insane. It's 10% HP every five seconds, not even counting the actual soul buff. And look at this. Karino uh, stepping up a little bit too far and just gets instant popped by the double ADC comp. And OMG just kind of imploding right now on themselves. Big Goldie with the Baron buff, two members dead, and they're just going to march down the mid lane. They have the minions right now with some backup coming on the way. Trogoth on the bot side, we'll see if they go for the double in him or if they look to make something else happen. It'd be a 4v4 in the mid lane, and Equalizer goes down onto my friend, and Chantle Crystal Arrow as well, but they're using all of their huge ultimates to rescue an inhibitor tower. My friend puts down the ultimate as well to kind of delete them. Look at that! Huge look damage. At the Insane damage right there. The healing as well. I mean, if they if they just take an equalizer, they back up, and then like five seconds later, they're just right back again. So it's just a continuous onslaught that OMG cannot answer. Yeah, my friend two's back to full HP already. Like even before they transitioned down to that bot tower, they were basically at 90% HP just off of passive healing from the ocean. They did hit Rivered with their ultimate, which gave them a huge boon in healing, but still, like, it's so hard to just outright burst down anybody from Iron Chef right now. I think even Spartan Monkey and Tamei have a fairly good shot at just surviving any type of engagement that comes their way. Yeah, Fallen uh, this far behind at this stage of the game. We're getting to 40 minutes, so teams, if they've been farming appropriately, we should be hitting those six item spikes we're getting pretty close to it all the way across the board and you know it's pretty much a matter of team comp right and the double adc comp is one of the best team fighting comps when you get to the late game they just put down so much damage with the auto attacks and as long as they position position themselves correctly i really don't see how iron chefs can really throw this one but i mean caster curse incoming right yeah i mean they did lose that fourth dragon fight for them uh when they split up around the the blue buff there but since baron's the next objective they don't have that opportunity because they're on the other side of the map it's going to be omg who can split up around their own blue buff but with two inhibitors down it basically is impossible for omg to push out aggressively here you can already see that bot wave the super minions at where the tier two tower used to be you do see my friend clearing out some vision and making sure that they know where the enemy is and they're just they're death balling it. They don't really need to be concerned. Bartha Bruce just tanking the tower, too. Like, he's just sitting here. Yeah, and Malkai just puts down the ultimate, forcing the Black Shield out of King Table. And, I mean, if they're looking for a fight, they need to catch them kind of between the junglers. Look at my friend, too, is out on the wayside. This may be their opportunity to get a pick. April putting some damage down as well. But if they don't take him down, he's going to be right back to full HP in a matter of moments. He's able to survive. Yeah, let's see. How long does it take him to get to full HP? So far, he's back to half HP after only about 10 seconds. It is 10% of missing HP. You can see, look at that. He just got 350 HP off of his passive, too. So, <laughs> he looks so tiny compared to Jogat, though. That's super funny. But again, just there's really not much to fear here. You survive. River is still basically where they were. They gained no HP back. Yeah, exactly. Still looking for the flank. They do see the death sentence onto the Shogoth, but they're just playing it nice and slow. Varus does have the repeated arrows coming through, and they're just letting the super minions push in the other waves. And I see playing this very conservatively, which understandably I think they would. You know, you don't want to botch your uh, your lead with a dive. You know, putting the aggro on the wrong person. You know, 
uh, Bartho Brew definitely tanky enough to probably make that tower dive successful, but they're just going to back off with the Baron. And are they going to Death Bush? Spotted out by Ash's Hawkshot. Yeah, the Hawkshot, really great tool here. The Equalizer is available though, so they do need to be a little bit careful here in terms of, you know, funneling themselves into the Baron Pit. But look at the waves. There's super minions crashing on the bot tower. There's super minions being caught here by Kurito, and they just can't challenge. They're giving up the Baron for free, but there is only one inhibitor left. It, we're not even getting notifications in the chat that's saying an inhibitor will be back soon. They just have to hold this, and I don't know if they have the damage to hold this particular fight. Yeah, that Baron buff is going to be huge for their siege. You know, the minions just dying pretty much instantly. Barthel uh, should on... just tank this, honestly. Like, they should not be waiting for a minion wave. Yeah, or if it's not, you know, their current minion wave, at least just side lanes as soon as the super minions are there. I mean, that's your go time. I mean, if they if they end up taking the fight and losing, they're still going to lose some minions just based on the super minions alone. But they step up, and they're just trying to put the damage down. Big Flash being expended from Thresh. He lands the flay, but the tower ends up going down, and now all hell can break loose. Or not. Uh, they end up backing away, still playing it very slow and making use of this Ocean Soul. That's triple inhibitor. Elder Dragon is up in 15 seconds. A flash forward from Maokai, it looks like, but not able to lock down the river. And they're just backing away from the triple inhibitor. Big hook onto the Varus. He's going to get popped almost immediately. There goes the Maokai and the ball of damage is all there. Martha Gru with a big recovery on the help. And here comes Clay forward with the flash on the side and they take four people for themselves and King Tehol is the only one left alive with Elder Dragon there for OMG to take for themselves. I'm at a loss for words. <laughs> that is insane. They just managed to get the perfect sequence of crowd control to come through. Spartan Monkey gets caught. King Tehol is going to die here eventually, but uh, it does give it the dragon too. And what I think is actually really bad here is that it staggers that death time. You can see 60 seconds on King Tehol when everybody else is at 30 or below. So that is going to be a problem in terms of defending the base. Thankfully, there's a lot of base to defend on the side of IC, so they can kind of sit back and relax for a little bit. But they they just gave up a big advantage that they had had. Yes, they had triple inhibitor, but the two they took down earlier are back alive again. So it's just one lane now that they have to defend on the side of OMG, and that is very much more doable. Definitely, OMG might as well call them GME as they hold their base onto the 45th <laughs> minute of this game. And you know, with the inhibitors, they have two inhibitors up. They still have both Nexus towers. So they're gonna be looking for this fight in the meantime. Um, we'll see if they're able to get those picks into the jungle and Iron Chefs, how are they gonna play this out? Are they gonna be able to wait out the Elder Dragon and then take the fight when it comes up? It's just so unfortunate that Spartan Monkey was so far forward. Enchanted Crystal Arrow from downtown lands onto the Cho'Goth. They're using all their damage on the Bartha Brew right now. He's all alone playing the front line. Huge shield comes from the Dark Forest template, but there's the Elder Dragon and the Execute. It is now a 5v4. We see uh, Super Minions on the top side are going to be pushing in, but they're going to take the fight, and Tristana ends up picking out the Thresh. It looks like he got hit by the Dark Binding. Kurito stepping forward and just tanking the tower like no one's business, and massive wave clear from the Varus and the Tristana and the Morgana. I'm at a loss of words. These teams are going to kill me. Yeah, I mean, this is really unfortunate for really both teams i mean it's a 4v4 which means you can't reasonably push too too hard and so you're just seeing one kill basically for the elder drake right it's going to be timing out relatively soon uh, as we do see it i should not have a timer on it but it'll be soon um and at that point the fights should be going back towards the side of oh that was super close that could have killed him um but the fight should be going back in favor of the Iron Chefs once this dragon falls away. And as long as they're not just completely blown up by crowd control again. Uh, I like that Snake Doctor is getting a lot more aggressive with their Enchanted Coast Arrows. We were pretty conservative with them earlier, and so it could have caused some problems. Ooh, yeah. catch them. But... Yeah, big pick on the egg rolls right here. King Tail lands the Soul Shackle, forcing the early Zhonyas. But here comes the Binding from the Nokai. He's going to lock him up. And Karito TPs, but it's too little, too late as Rumble gets shut down, and it's now a 5v4 in favor of the Iron Chefs. 
with Baron coming up in a minute and a half. A-Rolls will be up for then, so it looks like not too much is going to come out of that pick. But it's just a game of inches right now. Any little mistake could end to the end of it. So these teams have to be super careful going through these jungle, uh, jungle chokes through their vision. They have to be very cool, calm, and collected, or else they're going to throw this 48-minute game. And this is only game one. Yeah, this is just game one in this best of five, and the teams are looking, fighting each other on a razor's edge, really. And so, like you said, Egg Rolls is going to be back with 30 seconds to spare before the Baron actually becomes alive. So they will be able to recover nicely. The Hawkshot's going to show pretty much where everybody is. I don't know if that one clears the Pixel Bush specifically, um, but they very well could have been seen. They're acting like they weren't, though, so they're just kind of relaxing. But they were coming into full buys on just about everybody. You do see that raw giant belt on the side of Bartho Brew, but that will eventually be built into something. And I'm looking at the rest of the team, and everybody is maxed out on items over there on the side of OMG. Uh, top laner's not full. Uh, I think Scion isn't full. Yeah, Scion just has Aegis of the Legion, and then obviously the Kindle Gem there onto uh, Harjan. So, it's close. Farming's non-factor anymore. Yeah, exactly. You're pretty much just farming to push out the waves and keep the lane states. We see Silas on the bot side of the map with the Baron spawning. So looking to play this split map fight. Scion, did I hear Scion ultimate? I thought I heard it, but I guess I didn't. And then we see the Baron going down with the double ADC comp. It just gets melted. So they're going to have the empowered backs. The champion Crystal Arrow is used to delay the game, but it looks like we're looking for a base race now as River gets onto the bot side for a tower for himself. And Iron Chefs are gonna send one person back, but that's a Chogoth teleport going back. He had the uh, Empowered Baron recall, so I'm kind of concerned about that. He doesn't have a TP to join the fight. As Silas has the flanking ward, this is gonna be the fight. He's on the backside, dodges the chain of corruption, and here comes the Scion ultimate onto the front line. They pick out the Morgana, almost deleted instantly off the map. Saint Doctor on a killing spree. They're gonna take down Malkai as well. Tine is slowed. Here's the follow-up by River. He gets the follow-up fight, and he is in resurrection, but he's gonna be taken down right away as he comes out. Huge pick right there, and that teleport is going to prove to be the downfall of Iron Chess as OMG are setting their eyes on the Nexus. That happens. That was a very nice call there from Rivered. Recognized that the teleport had been used and there was no longer a way for Barthogre to join the fight. Yeah, they're using everything on him right now. Death Sentence, Enchanted Crystal Arrow. We see the feast onto the Silas. He's pretty low though. Is he gonna be taken out? Barthogre takes him down with the feast, but the rest of his team is gonna be able to clear up with the Kraken Slayer and these long death timers. They're not gonna be able to come back in time. Game one going to Omega Gaming. Yeah, I was a little concerned about the flank or the excuse me, the split push there from Rivered. I honestly thought that had uh, Iron Chef just hard W keyed down the mid lane, they would have just been able to win out because it would have forced the teleport for just coming back to life. Uh, but it would have been for the most part a five v four until the teleport came through, and so you would have been able to really, uh, you know, force your hand there on the side of Iron Chefs. But they played a little scared. They teleported back instead of using that empowered recall, like you mentioned. And then as soon as that TP comes out, you just see River get safe, teleports to the mid lane, and that was all they she wrote. And that's game one going over to omg yeah, i just gotta tip my hat off to omg right there noticing that chogoth used that teleport because they saw that teleport onto the bot side so when rivered was able to get out up and out of sight being able to get that flanking ward on the bot side knowing that they were going to be in an advantageous position i mean the 80 carries just got split from the morgana and i, I mean for iron chefs remember it was a game of poke it's tormented soil, dark bindings. It's waiting until you land those critical skill shots, but they just caught, got caught forward a little bit too far, and that's kind of what spelled the end for them. Yeah, I'm, I'm very interested in this next game draft because we're going to start seeing some adaptions come through since it is the best of five, and we may get a side swap here as well. So I, I'm, I have no idea what to expect anymore. Yeah, Iron Chefs do get their choice of a uh, side for game two. We'll see if they look for the counter pick on red side or if they're looking for those crucial first picks. Um, so first pick Scion, how'd you feel about it overall? I mean, 
I thought it was going to get hard countered, and I thought that we were really going to be able to see that punished. But then, you know, it went into the mid lane, which kind of really skewed everything in a different direction. So the pick ended up surviving. I don't think it's what won or lost them the game. I think you could have largely put any tank in their place, and we would have had a very similar result. Um, because I think that game was more decided on decision making and late game macro uh, than any single champion. So I think, honestly, if we literally just got a run back of those same ten champions, we could see a different outcome very easily. Uh, exactly. I mean, you saw a very critical moments in that game. We saw the third dragon fight is kind of what tilted it from Omega Gaming's uh, first part to the Iron Chest being able to start that dragon stacking with the Ocean Soul. And then we saw with Iron Chefs, they were able to march out and get triple inhib, but just not able to coordinate their fight effectively. Spartan Monkey getting caught by that Enchanted Crystal Arrow at the very beginning. I mean, he's got to be feeling it himself, but I mean, it's a long series. That's why it's a best of five. You really got to have that strong mental to kind of clear yourself out of that and, you know, continue forward. Uh, so with that being said, I think we're going to take it to a little bit of an intermission after a 50 minute game. I think we're going to need a, a little bit of time to recover for ourselves, but we'll come back with you when draft is up and ready. Ladies and gentlemen, for Risen Esports, we'll be right back with game two of the pre-made Rampage semifinals. Take a moment right here, feeling like a sound gear. Driving towards the sun With a rose and a gun Feel the wind in my hair Going nowhere I swear Like an outlaw on the run Dangerous but it's so fun Running, running
our way into the draft of game two of the pre-made Rampage semifinal series. We had a 50-minute banger between OMG and the Iron Chefs. Uh, it's It was a game that pretty much took our breath away, both literally and uh, metaphorically, with the kind of plays that we saw. I mean, back and forth, we saw decisions made left and right, and a couple big ones ended up sealing the game overall. How are you feeling going into game two? Do you think the uh, Iron Chefs are going to be able to overcome their mental, or do you think that OMG is going to kind of you know, steamroll this one going forward? I think that both teams will recognize that they could have won that game and could have lost that game. Um, granted, those are the only two options in most games, but you know, we did used to have a DDoSing issue in League of Legends. So I guess technically there's a third option, but I think both teams recognized mistakes and what they could have changed coming in. I don't think draft was an issue. It all came down to those macro late game decisions where you're trying to rotate as a team and you just got blown up on both sides. So, I mean, looking at the ban phase already, it's identical to game number one. So with the teams on the same sides, there is a chance for most of a rematch coming through. Thresh is the only change in the ban. Last game, that had been a victor. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. I mean, OMG picking up the Morgana for themselves. So uh, opting not to take that Scion first pick, I think that might have been a little bit of the cheese uh, for them in order to you know pick the Scion and place that mid. Um, you know, Tristana, it, it's going to force IC, I think, to pick up a, a, a mage for themselves, maybe a Victor or an Orianna for themselves. Um, but they're going to end up picking the Scion on the second rotation. And pretty interesting. I guess that's a highly contested pick between these two teams, but I guess that's the battle of comfort. Yeah, I think both teams recognized something that they didn't enjoy playing against. Uh, OMG noticing that the Morgana caused a lot of problems both early on and in certain late game scenarios. So they picked that away. It's not a hard thing to pilot since it is just Morgana. Um, so it makes sense to steal that away. I see then going on the offensive and said, hey, Scion really caused a lot of problems for our Tristana mid. They weren't able to spike early on. They weren't able to pop off and carry incredibly hard. And it was just a really difficult time to push up the wave and make a rotation. So they pick away the Scion and the Tristana at the same time. So OMG are going to be forced to either pick up a different tank mid like Set or Orn, or so just OMG go for a mage pick and the victor is the choice. Tank mid like set or Orn. Yeah, and uh, OMG really opting to control that space and the terrain. I mean, they did it earlier with the Equalizer, but, you know, Morgana with the Soul Shackles, Victor with the Gravity Shield, that's going to uh, allow them to kind of control the fights and, and split up the team like they did previously in the last match and taking the victor for themselves. So right away, three high priority champions that we've seen in the international meta, um, but pretty squishy so far from the side of OMG. Yeah, which, I mean, we, we said their last draft was fairly squishy too. So I, I mean, I don't think that's a, a hard itemization so far. Corky previously banned away in the last game, now being picked up as well here for the Iron Chefs. And I, I don't know where Corky... I mean, like, traditionally, it would be Tristana bot Corky mid. That's just how it works. And I think Corky does fairly well into Victor as well. Um, and, I mean, Tristana does really well into Varus. So, so far, I think Iron Chefs are getting some really great counter pick selections. Uh, it's just up to them to actually pilot them appropriately. Into the second band phase, Silas, Maokai, problems being removed away. I mean, this is a very different draft from game number one. Exactly. OMG definitely hating those saplings. I mean, with the Comet and the amount of damage he's able to do with the Imperial Mandate, I mean, we saw what happened when Snake got caught out with that binding over the wall of the Dragon Fight, just pretty much popped to each of those saplings. So taking away the Maokai really opens up the, the map in terms of vision control, because if you can't control everything with vision, you can still control a lot of choke points with those saplings. Um, banned away from, uh, looks like target banned onto River here, taking away the Silas, who was able to get on top of the, the carries with the Everfrost and with those chains, and again, stealing away some pretty big ultimates. I mean, right now, the, the big ultimate for him to steal away would probably be the Scion ultimate engage. Um, but, I mean, still taking that away and, you know, seeing what River has in his pocket in order to, to keep that commanding force of top lane that he had in game one. 
Yeah, they've been with the Gangplank as well, which is a new addition to that band phase. We didn't see it in game number one, but now Iron Chefs are going to be able to do some funky stuff here. They don't have a support. They didn't have a jungler picked up, so they go for the Diana. Very strong. She's been seeing a lot of play recently in the jungle. She's kind of like this weird tank assassin, uh, tanky assassin, excuse me, where she can get very beefy and hard to kill and still does a grip of damage onto squishies if you can find the right target and so far all of MG omg is looking like a very juicy target they still need a uh, support and a top laner you would imagine so they do have their run of the picks basically Volibear bear could fill either role and we're gonna find out which role that is in just a second and i said either role thinking that it was top jungle not support jungle or support top yeah, Bolo Bear is able to kind of lock down single target CC, but you see the emo immobile carries on the side of Victor, Varus, and Morgana means Diana is looking pretty juicy to get into that back line, but the Wukong coming up. So Wukong able to do a lot, can go forward with the engage, can also peel with his, you know, several ultimates. He's able to cast and recast it yet again. So the team for OG able to be very versatile, can go forward, can go backward. I really like this team pump coming out of OMG. Yeah, I mean, I really liked the last one, too. And yes, they ended up eventually winning, but it was a bit of a struggle bus for them. Um, I'm interested in Iron Chef's final pick. It is going to be the Nautilus. Now, um, Nautilus is receiving changes on 11.11 uh, to make him more fitting into the jungle role. But for now, he is still just a support. So actually, what is the... Is it Morgana support on OMG? I think it is. It might be, and that's you know yeah. pretty big for Morgana. I mean, Morgana has a ton of damage with the Tormented Soil and the Dark Binding, so not being able to hit those item spikes earlier in the game uh, may be a little bit more difficult for them. Um, picking the Nautilus into the Morgana or the Volo Bear, it's kind of interesting to me because, I mean, Nautilus, it takes so long for his depth from below to actually land on someone, it's so easy for them to, to target with the black shield and kind of peel for themselves. But I mean, that's kind of the Nautilus staple is the ult one, as soon as you see the black shield, you go on the other. But you know, huge carries, a lot of damage coming from OMG. I mean, everyone is capable on that team of doing some pretty significant amounts of damage. And uh, Iron Chef's again, kind of running this double marksman type comp. Corky kind of a pseudo marksman, you know, with that EP scaling. Um, and it's just pretty interesting all the way around. They do have some good frontline in the Scion and the Nautilus, um, but it's just a matter of are they going to be able to delete OMG before OMG deletes them? And it's going to be another volatile matchup. It's going to be a great one for us to see. Yeah, I think the adjustment here from OMG is they still have a very similar composition. They're just a lot more focused at diving and killing the backline. Whereas, because they, like, they removed their tank, they don't have a Scion or an Orn or a Set. They have Volibear or Wukong, neither of which is a true tank. They're both bruisers. They both, you know, build some damaging items and just try and kill you before they die. And they're both all in, in a certain sense, too. Because once they dive that backline, they don't really have a way out. Uh, Wukong clone, I, I guess, technically counts but like you're using it currently to get an additional stack of your ultimate off so it's not always there for that defensive timing it's more of an offensive tool in its current state so makes sense to have that back up and ready to go for it and yeah, so well, their compositions like it's a bit stronger in terms of killing that back line which is where they struggled a lot in game one but i i don't know <laughs> morgana is so weird to me to see in a support role because she is so strong in the jungle but I hate that Iron Chefs counterpicked their own support. Yeah, a very questionable draft from both sides. I mean, I can see OMG, maybe their jungler isn't too comfortable with the Morgana jungle, so they end up you know, putting it into the support role just because they want to take it away from Iron Chefs. I mean, that was such a big pick that we saw from Iron Chefs. They were able to get so much going with the, the Dark Binding picks and the Soul Shackles, uh, you know, the jungler, King Tejo, did a lot of work on that Morgana team, unfortunately just can't follow through with it. So, you know, taking away a power pick is good, but putting it in an off-roll position, not 100% sure, but I've seen support Morganas, you know, carry into the late game via 30, 40 minutes and having an additional damage source on your support, it could hurt. Yeah, we'll see exactly how that breaks out in a couple seconds. I think the Morgana pick, like you said, it's such a great steal away because the jungle priority is so skewed in most matchups. And the rumble, 
was really successful, but it it again wasn't what won or lost them the game. And so OMG are looking to gain some more control in their own life in the game. And I like that. I like that the team is recognizing they need a little bit more initiative. Um, and right now, you know, I see they do have a really strong composition, a very strong front to back as well. Scion and Nautilus can play for the front line, give Tristana quirky time to hopefully melt away at these bruisers. And then you have Diana who can really disrupt that back line. The only fear there is that the dark binding hits onto anybody except Scion, because at that point you're locked down, you can't engage the fight, you're stuck where you are. And then Wukong and Volibear can both just dive up back on top of you. And they're gonna kill you before that dark binding ends. Just there's nobody except Scion that can survive that right now. And I think we're going to be able to confirm that some Morgana support with Volo Bear being locked into the jungle role for egg rolls. And something that I, I kind of see about these two teams right now is from OMG, I think one of the big reasons they're able to win is getting those key picks with the Enchanted Crystal Arrow and those long range engage tools with the Equalizer. They don't really have as big of a range engage. I mean, Morgana, various chains of corruption, those kind of things, those all have to play kind of out of vision or get those flinks like Wukong. Um, I'm trying to look at his name. River was able to get that huge flank onto the Silas, which ultimately helped them win the game. So it's pretty much a, a game of flanking positions. You know, the Scion can just run down the mid lane and, and get people if they're in the lane and not able to get out into the jungle. Um, but it's really going to come down to can Diana get the flank first or can Wukong and Volibear get the flank first? It's such a flank heavy game. So it's going to put a lot of emphasis on the macro and the vision control for the teams this game. Yeah, and with last game going to that 50-minute mark and eventually ending due to a macro mistake, you definitely know both teams took some time after that game one, thought about it a little bit harder, tried to clean up what they can, and are looking to come back in a bit stronger. Exactly. So we are locked in. It is confirmed Morgana support, and we are going to move our way into game two and a little bit after a little bit of time for spectator delay. So we're going to take a very brief intermission. We'll see you guys back on the rift. Take a moment right here. Feeling like a sound gear. Driving towards the sun with a rose and a gun. Feel the wind in my hair. Going nowhere, I swear. Like an outlaw on the run. Dangerous, but it's so fun. Running, running.
So with the dragon coming up in about two minutes, we'll see if he goes back and looks to use that to get an advantageous spot on the dragon fight. And I mean, Corky Package does a lot of damage if it's used appropriately, but I'm not sure if he's gonna be able to get in and get out. Uh, interesting series we find ourselves in now, as we do get the teleport in from Tim May back into that mid lane. Gank potential coming through, but it's really difficult for Diana to actually collapse onto Morgana Varus, right? Like, Black Shield is a thing. She doesn't have any gap closers that gets her quickly over a wall or anything like that. So she just kind of has to brute force it. And Egg Rolls is going to be so much better at that. Although, tanking the tower shot's not a good look. And Diana does have the flank ability. So here we're going to see the 1v1. Has the shield available, gets the ultimate. And Volibear forced to ult away. Following up on King Tejo, who's going to just burn down as Corky gets the solo kill onto the victor on the backside as well. Meanwhile, on the bot lane, Barris goes up, gets hooked right away. Tristana able to turn it around with the Hail of Blades. Rocket jump forward again. Exhaust is expelled. A huge win for Iron Chefs on that front. Ariel is still looking for danger, though. Yep, puts the W down, lands the damage, has the press the attack. King Tejo secures the blue buff, but Ariel secures his life. As he gets the first kill back onto him, his first, or sorry, second of the game, and Agro's really kind of stamping his authority on this jungle matchup. Yeah, it's another really strong pick too. Volibear quite volatile. Once they can really start breaking open to these team fights, the issue is it's both carries of Iron Chefs getting kills. Tame got the solo kill. Spartan Monkey got a kill as well, and so we're already seeing the mythic here completed for Spartan Monkey, which is that Kraken Slayer one more time. Yes, we do see the Dusk Blade completed as well for Snake Doctor, but it's gonna be a bit before it really starts to come online it is just some attack damage and some lethality no bonuses coming through obviously yet on either mythic but i do think that spartan monkey might get a bit more at this dragon fight than the dusk blade yeah that gale force sorry uh kraken slayer is going to be able to do a lot getting those uh third auto attack off basically a, a free vein proc um, it also does a lot for objectives too. It makes it that much faster to take down the, the neutral objectives such as the Dragon and the Baron. Uh, we see attempts to steal over the side. So much poke coming and Egg Rolls uses the ult to get over, uses the fast cone to get over, but here comes Bartho Brew, goes for it. Package is going to tear people apart and Corky going on the backside looking for the assassination on the Snake Doctor. But the fight is breaking out everywhere. Egg slashes forward, gets the secure kill and King Tejo goes down as well. Double kill for Wukong. Scion trying to answer back, but Morgana goes golden, lands the binding, and that is going to be a four for nothing. Actually, an unofficial ace, I believe, as I think Nautilus got picked a little bit earlier in that fight. So a huge win for Omega Gaming, and they are going to bust this game pretty much wide open, giving up the, the dragon stacking, but are able to secure the kills and the team fight victory. And they're, they're fine with that. It's a Cloud Drake. It really doesn't matter. It's called Clowned for a reason, but they, they get a huge amount of gold influx, especially into Rivered specifically, who was so crucial to the carry and victory in game number one. Now on a fairly explosive champion in the Wukong, already had that Divine Sunder completed when they came down for that dragon fight. So they're going to be able to go back with basically an item's worth of gold. They're at 2,100 gold right now, which is a huge, huge boon right after picking up a completed mythic so they're in good shape they are going to pick up this rift herald as well it looks like and things are really looking good yeah having the money on the right people you know we talked a little bit earlier about the carries and the squishies and who is able to get the flank is who is able to get onto the enemy i mean we saw corky go for the assassination onto the back line and I mean, if you are the carry for your team, you don't want to be going one for one in these trades. You want to be able to, you know, get the damage off and play these extended team fights. Um, but I mean, just the whole team from OMG just played that so well in order to win that fight. They are up over 4,000 gold, about 4,500 gold, just 16 minutes into this game. And, and it's a question of, can they keep the snowball going? Can they stop their mistakes from coming up? Can they clean up their first games? Because there's a reason why they were undefeated in this league and it's up to them to show that they can secure these games. 
Yeah, and going back to that dragon fight, you mentioned the, the Corky package in. It actually lost them a ton of damage by doing that because it knocked everybody out of Bartha Brew's decimating smash, which, you know, this early in the game is a lot of damage coming from that Scion. Oh, no. Oh, Chain of Corruption lands onto the Nautilus, who is also tanking tower from far away. They just step a little bit too far. A Snake Doctor gets his second kill of the game. And it goes forward, gets the ultimate down, and a clutch Zanyas is going to see him stay alive, and they turn it around, and Snake Doctor says, thank you very much for the gold in my pocket, and Iron Chef's just trying a little bit too hard to make something happen as they just get three kills to OMG. Rivered, on the other hand, taking some tower shots, Martha Rue uses the ultimate to go forward, but Rivered able to get away with the clone. OMG just winning all the way across the map. Yeah, OMG, hard winning that bottom fight. Just almost an int there from the Iron Chefs. They, you know, definitely disrespected the survivability that Morgana had at that point. I mean, has the fully completed Zonia's, you know, it's their first item. They didn't even complete a Mythic first because it's so crucial on support Morgana to have that life-saving item and it worked out perfectly there and then them both getting caught by the soul shackles was just absolutely brutal they did have the uh, nice sequence of uh, abilities there from snake doctor as well looking very comfortable on the various already here today um and i'd say arguably even more comfortable than spartan monkey did last game and playing that lethality varus if you're able to get you know those arrows off onto the carries it's going to be a lot of damage uh, I believe we are on Ocean Soul, so, you know, it's kind of like last game, is Ocean Soul going to be able to help you survive <laughs> that poke? It comes on uh, back. They stole away the blue buff with the, with the depth strike. Uh, and we saw a jungler invest into the top side on River too, but River just able to walk away. And Iron Chef's just trying to make something happen everywhere around, but they have to get very creative with their vision and their picks. 30 seconds for the first Ocean Drake to come up. Going to be second of the game, so it's not going to be anything too crucial in terms of dragon stacking. Uh, but we'll see how much priority the teams push on it. And this is really great for both teams to be able to get a lot of ocean dragons. Uh, you know, last game it was so one-sided because of the first two dragons going the way of OMG. So it meant that when Iron Chefs did eventually collect their soul, it was four ocean dragons. And it should have been a nigh unlosable position because it's it's 10 percent hp at that point it is an unheard of amount um but this time both teams can get three if they're able to secure the soul so it's a lot more even in that sense we're not going to be able to see one team just overwhelmingly take dragons but they actually have to get to the dragon and right now we do see rivered coming just out of base has the teleport available not really Ooh. any flank wards just flank minions yeah, Scion Ultimate goes into the wall, so they're not going to be able to make it happen. Aegle's taking up a lot. Big package all the way across. We'll see if he's able to keep the damage going. Diana gets a shutdown on the Varus, and the team fight is breaking out everywhere on both fronts. Lupong into the back line, able to take down two, looking for his triple kill, and he gets it. OMG secures the ace and the dragon, and it looks like they will they go for the Baron. I think it might be a little bit too early for that but just furthering their lead, about 9,000 gold. I don't know how Iron Chips are gonna just answer it. They just have an answer for every engage tool. The Scion Ultimate going into the wall was pretty uh, lackluster. I mean, that had to be disappointing, but they decided to continue the engage and they paid for it dearly. Yeah, the other issue is that even with Snake Doctor being the one that falls, you know, they were very far ahead. They were 4-2-6 and six heading into that dragon fight with a 30 CS lead over the direct lane opponent. And they were stuck on that package uh, trail. Like, they were stuck. No chance at escape. They got hooked up by my friend and they just, they died. And even still, there was too much damage and too much gold from OMG. I mean, obviously, Rivered was mega far ahead at 4-1 with two items completed. Now they're 7-1, two and a half items completed with boots as well. And there is nobody that can stop Wukong at this moment because there's just not enough damage on the side of IC. They don't have any tanks on the side of IC. And they have Corky going Immortal Shield Bow, of all things. Yeah, I mean, Corky looking for the survivability, but, I mean, you'd probably see if he's going for that assassin type, I mean, maybe looking for a Gale Force instead. Um, so a little bit of an interesting buy from him. Uh, it's just really interesting to see, though, when Wukong goes in, 
it's they have to blow their engage tools to either peel the Wugong or they have to use their engage tools to basically go after the carries. So it's kind of like a damned if you do, damned if you don't moment. I mean, it's like pick your poison. Who do you want to deal with? The carries or do you want to deal with the Wukong who's just shredding your backline? And Riverhood's actually been super late to these fights and it's worked out so great to their advantage because they're trading one for aces and things like that because, you know, a lot of the tools are being used early in these fights on the side of Iron Chefs. And so then Wukong can show up and just do whatever they want for free with no fear of being crowd controlled. Yeah, Baron started up from the side of OMG. Morgana goes forward, goes gold, and uses the Soul Shackles early as a takedown. Wukong on the back line, just deleting the enemy team. Diana trying to do some work on the back side, but we just see a big stun, and Victor is able to kite it out. And OMG is going to take the team fight. They're going to take the Baron at 22 minutes into the game, and it's looking bleak for the Iron Chefs. This is uh, routing of teams. This is a very different... Uh, OMG, than we saw in game number one, they're looking so much more comfortable, they're looking so much more as a unit, and they're very decisive in their calls, whereas, you know, the game one, they got the early lead, sure, but they weren't very quick about doing anything after that, and so they lost a little bit of attrition, and finally they just won off macro at the end, but this time, they're leaving nothing to chance, they're pulling the trigger every second of every fight, and coming out so far ahead because of it. Yeah, pulling the team in every which direction. And I mean, I think I saw Wukong didn't get a single kill that fight, but he was able to take down a lot of people with his Cyclone on the backside. And I think Varus was just able to snipe out most of the enemy team. Just that uh, piercing arrow that he has with this Lethality Varus build with the Man Immune and the the Dusk Blade. I was going to call it Blade of Dust Bar or something. I, I had it kind of messed up. Almost had it correct. Um, but meanwhile, Scion being tanked up, Chain of the Correction is used, and the Cyclone is used as well. And they're looking to take him down the second Dark Binding lands again, and the tank just gets shredded. Holy! Meanwhile, on the bot side, Varus, or Victor is looking to take down Nautilus. I think he took down Spartan Monkey, if I'm not, in the, in the 1v2. Yeah, just popped him. Absolutely annihilated, deleted from the map. Egg Roll's even using the ultimate to disable the turret here, and there's nothing on the side of Iron Chefs to stop this. Yeah, using that ultimate to push them off the tower and to break open the base. Um, they're gonna leave the inhibitor standing. I think that's going to be the right call for now, unless they're looking to end at this point. Victor just splitting in the bot lane himself. So macro-wise, no one can answer Kirito in the bot lane. No one can answer the push into the top lane. They're just going to take it a little bit more slowly, I believe. Uh, nope, they do take down the inhibitor as well. They're just looking to choke them out across the map in every single lane. Yeah, the team on the side of Iron Chefs is so split right now. They can't contend with every single lane being pushed. The Baron's just too, proving too powerful. They lost the top inhibitor. They lost the mid tower. They're losing the team fight. Yeah, there's the Dark Binding, there's the Chain of Corruption, and the CC stacking is just so good from OMG. Barthur Brew trying to make something happen. Corky is wandering around with that package, looking like my FedEx driver's out in the country, uses the package to go all the way across, but River takes him down as he pretty much dives into his death. And with the super minions coming in, not super, the Baron empowered minions, they're gonna set their eyes on the Nexus Tower. There goes one. Wukong going on the second one. King Taeho goes forward, tries to get a huge ult, get the shutdown onto the Varus, but it's too little too late as OMG take game number two in convincing fashion in 25 minutes, half the time of game one. Half the time, four times as many kills, it feels like. It was 29 to nine in terms of KD, and the game ended with a almost 20,000 gold lead, looking a little bit closer, was 17,000 gold between the two teams. And that was that was a rollover. That was just an absolute stomp from the OMG team. And they are looking so much better after that game one. They, they won it, and they still took it personally to themselves and proved it to be better in game two. Yeah, you and I were kind of saying stuff about the Morgana pick going into the bot lane and not going into the jungle, but I mean, that Nautilus into the Morgana, every single time the bot lane tried to take a fight, it was Black Shield into Dark Binding into pretty much instant death overall. They just could not take the fight, and OMG just took it and ran with it. 
Um, River just doing big things on the mid game team fights, finding the great flanks, got that early solo kill, just great play all the way around the map. Carito putting pressure down on Timmy in the mid lane, getting that one V two solo kill on the bot side. I mean, OMG is just looking stacked in game two. So with their back on the ropes, uh, the Iron Chef's got to make something happen in Game 3. Let's see if they can pull something out in drafts or maybe in macro terms. But, I mean, they really got their work cut out for them. Yeah, there's a lot to be done here. They have to come into this Game 3 draft with something behind them because they either need to completely change their game plan in terms of uh, champion select or they need to just be more active on the rift. They tried to get some stuff done, but they were caught time and time again by the rivered flanks, and the Silas was banned away, but, I mean, the Wukong proved to be so much stronger of a pick. Yeah, the, the AoE knockup just did a lot. The AoE damage, getting on top with the Divine Sunderer, able to basically pop the enemy carries. Um it's just they had no answer for it. They had no answer for the dive. They had no answer for the poke. It was just such a well-rounded team comp from the side of OMG. And they were able to take that comp and roll into a pretty easy game to win. I mean, they still you know, had to make the picks and had to, had to wait for it to happen. But their patience paid off. They just waited for the other team to engage and just punished them right away. Yeah, so like I said, things need to change in Game 3 draft if the Iron Chefs want to stay in this series and stay with a chance to get it to the Grand Finals, but I don't know I don't know if there's enough of the tank left. I mean, that Game 2 was quite quick after Game 1. It most certainly was. So when we come back from this short intermission break, we'll get to the draft as soon as we can, but we're going to be going into Game 3 We'll see if OMG sweeps the semifinals and secures their spot into the finals of the Rampage League or if Iron Chefs have something to say about it. Stay tuned. We'll be back in a few minutes. Take a moment right here Feeling like a sound gear Driving towards the sun With a rose and a gun Feel the wind in my head
myself, Acolyte, and Doctor are here to bring you game three of the semifinals for the Rampage League. OMG up 2-0 right now against the Iron Chefs. Game one was spectacularly close with a 50-minute banger. All ended on a key team fight in the mid lane. Game two, a little bit more convincing on the side of OMG. Um, but we're going into game three. It is do or die for the Iron Chefs. Yeah, it all comes down to this. They have one game separating themselves from being eliminated here from the tournament. And so we're heading into this pick and ban phase. And game two is so, so dominant that we have to see a change from the Iron Chefs. They ban away the victory again. They banned a game one. They had a little bit less of a struggle. Game two, it didn't get banned away and it, it did quite well and they're even going to go as far away as banning that Morgana they don't want to play against it and they don't want to risk giving it up for the first pick yeah so with these bands it looks like they're giving up the Ezreal and the Thresh uh, Thresh was available in game one so um, and the Thresh you know, did a little bit of work with the with the hooks but it was really the arrow and the uh, the equalizers that saw them secure the game one victory so we'll see what they end up picking. OMG opting for the first pick, Volibear. Uh, Volibear was in the jungle last game, so uh, it's going to be determined if we'll see it in the jungle again. Like we will be, but Iron Chefs are going to answer with a various pick of their own after seeing how devastating it could have been in game two. Yeah, and I really like the Volibear first pick. It's giving egg rolls the priority to be aggressive in the jungle, to get into these lanes quick and dirty, and hopefully get the rest of the lanes ahead. We saw them do it a couple times there. Obviously, there was that first blood play in the middle where they flashed into the ultimate and stuff like that, and it was really, really sick to watch how egg rolls was able to adjust their play to the new pick instead of being on that rumble in game one. Maokai is available again as well for the Iron Chefs. It was okay in game one i really don't think it was super successful um you know it did fall out of the meta for a reason it just doesn't quite have the same punch as something say like the rel or the thrasher just something that's beefy tanky and has a lot of crowd control so it is picked up ezreal like you were just saying is available they're hovering it they lock it in yeah, the Maokai in game one, I mean, had the saplings up and was able to zone with the Imperial Mandate. Um, but anytime they use the ultimate, you know, to engage the fight, Silas stole the ultimate and used it right back. So it just ended up in this huge stalemate that really didn't end up with too much. Um, so picking the Ezreal in this second round is going to offer more of a poke comp. And, you know, pretty squishy. I mean, Ezreal, if he steps up and gets the Twisted Advance on by the Maokai, if he tries to Arcane Shift away, the Maokai will follow him. So, I mean, that could work two ways. It could work, you know, that's guaranteed CC, but Ezreal can bait him into a Twisted Advance and then take him under the tower with him. And uh, really capitalize on that over-aggression that we saw in Game 2 that ultimately saw Iron Chefs meet their demise. Uh, following up with the Seraphine, so we're going to, you know, more of a poke comp. Uh, does have that AoE healing ability and the AoE CC lockdown. And Zen Zhao from Iron Chefs, what do you feel about that one? Uh, the, the Zen Zhao is kind of um, out of left field. I know they received some changes a while back. I, I don't remember how much it came through um, be between the PBR and the actual in game live. So. I think Xin Zhao's a strong pick and can do quite well into the jungle. It's very active, very aggressive. Um, so, I mean, it could come into play. I think Volibear should still potentially be able to win, um, but it'll come down to the amount of healing between the two characters. Yeah, I mean, Xin Zhao is that early game jungler that we all know and love. Looking for those level two ganks on mid after the red buff, looking for those early skirmishes. And, you know, for Iron Chefs, their early game has not been their best friend. So they're going to be putting their apples into this Xin Zhao early game. And we'll see if they're going to be able to take the fight to OMG, you know, prior to the 10 minute mark where we've seen the game kind of fall apart for them. Yeah, they they need to be a little bit quicker to the punch. And so I do like to see them drafting a little bit more appropriately, banning away the Silas and the Wukong, which were obviously problematic champions for them in the hands of River. So I'm, Assuming there's still something in the back pocket here, uh, if we look to game two, they banned away the Gangplank, so maybe that's the option here. We don't quite know the top top laner for the Iron Chefs. They are picking that Malzahar, which I assume is the mid lane, um, but it's relatively blind because we don't know if the Seraphina support or uh, mid as well. The Senna 
doesn't really clear up the image, so we still don't really know where OMG is going. Yeah, you can see a Senna Seraphine, which is just disgusting with the amount of heals and sustain that they have in the bot lane with an Ezreal mid. You could see Ezreal bot with the with the Senna and Seraphine just playing that really slow, controlled style. And Orn picked up, definitely going to be in the top lane and going to be blind. They're leaving their last pick to Bartho Brew, who has had some trouble in the series so far dealing with Rivered. So Orn going to be something a little bit less in your face than the Silas, than the Wukong. So we'll see how Bartho Brew ends up taking this fight. Is he going to go tank for tank? Or is he going to do something a little bit more carry oriented? And there's the Gnar. Really popular pick all the way around the world right now. And Gnar does have the ability with that percent health damage with his W to really contest Orn in the early levels and to get that push on. So, you know, interesting draft from Iron Chefs. I mean, I don't see too many people rushing the Quicksilver Sash right away. And Malzahar just does so good at locking down a key target if the team is able to follow up. Um, I don't know. How do you feel about it? It, uh, it can be very strong. Um, you know, there's a lot that you can use to, to catch people out. There is a, a pretty significant world, though, where I don't know if the QSS is super necessary, in all honesty, when you look at the composition that OMG has, because uh, everybody except Ezreal Senna has a way to break it uh, in terms of the Nether Grasp. So it's it's fairly safe to break it you know volibear can dive in orn can do it from far away with the ultimate the encore is a really amazing uh, ultimate in terms of just controlling the game and because of how far forward volibear and orn are gonna be it is gonna go for miles like it is gonna go through everybody every single time seraphine goes for that encore play so i think it's an incredibly strong pick i'm super excited to see where they end up going i i have to imagine I don't have to match. I, I think it's an Ezreal mid. I, I think that Seraphine Senna is the stronger duo here because of the way the champions interact with each other. Um, Ezreal's not amazing at a solo lane because he doesn't have a lot of wave clear and heading into something like Mazahar that has a ton of wave clear, you're kind of biting yourself in the foot. But Seraphine, I think, will also eventually get over pushed by the Mazahar. Yeah, I mean, Mazahar just puts down the uh, the E on top of the minions and just kind of pushes the lane and says, here you go, and then moves around with the Xin Zhao. So if you're looking to dominate that early game with the Xin Zhao pick and, you know, roam together as that 2v2 duo, Malzahar is a great champion to do that with. And we're going to see right now who the mid laner is. Carito picks up the Seraphine, so it's going to be an Ezreal Senna bot lane. And you know, like you said, Seraphine, a little bit easier time dealing with that wave push of the Malzahar, uh, but Ezreal and Senna, um, you know, they're gonna be the ones that have to sustain and kind of win that poke fight. Seraphine should be able to clear the little minions that Malzahar clears, his little pets, pretty well. Um, they are pretty weak, and Seraphine has that AoE ability to kind of clear those minions out, which is what leads to a lot of Malzahar's wave clear. Um, but at the end of the day, it's, it's kind of going to be all about this 2v2. Uh, can OMG survive this early game aggression from the Iron Chefs? Yeah, they're going to be able to get a lot done, and especially with how squishy uh, that bot lane is. In the early game, the advance from Maokai, I think, will be really strong, uh, unless they do over push and he gets caught under a tower, in which case, yeah, you're kind of toast. But in the mid to late game, if Ezreal is the main target here, uh, from my friend, then you know the the sequence of events that you were talking about earlier, where you arcane shift backwards and the the twist advance follows the whole way. I think that's bad for my friend in this situation because they're not going to be building that tank Maokai that can soak everything up. It's going to be, you know, this squishy Imperial Mandate Maokai that just kind of pops in the face of you know Seraphine, Volibear, and Senna. Like it's going to be a lot to deal with here. OMG does have a lot of sustain as well with the Seraphine heal and the Senna. So with the Varus with the long range piercing arrows or Malzahar with his silence wall, um, they're going to be able to sustain that poke in the long run and just kind of wait it out. They do not have a very high damage team uh, in terms of just burst potential, but they are able to win the fight of attrition. So OMG has to play these team fights pretty slow, pretty methodical but they have shown excellent team fighting in games one and two, and they want to carry that into game three. 
Yeah, that momentum, if they keep it going, is going to steamroll the early game once again here for the Iron Chefs. But I think that the champion selection that Iron Chefs have gone with here does give them some breathing room. Um, you know, Mazahar, once they hit level 6 specifically, they'll be able to really open up some picks that are kind of cheeky with the Jin Zhao combo. Uh, especially the Maokai, if they can get a roam off or two, would really start to accentuate that. Uh, because Jin Zhao is such a wild card here that if it's successful, it is really successful if it if it falls off and starts falling behind it'll have a lot of struggles because it's one of those ed carry melee champions that has to be strong to stay strong and if they fall behind they just kind of pop but i don't know i haven't seen jinja in a while so i don't know what the current build exactly is going to be i think it'll be kind of bruisery but they might need to build it a bit tankier in order to survive in the face of omega right now well, it has to be some source of comfort to pick this up when your back is against the wall. Iron Chefs have to take the next three games looking for the reverse sweep against OMG, who have looked fairly convincing in game two. So we're going to take a quick break as we allow spectator delay to go through. A brief intermission will see us come back. We will see you on the rift. Take a moment right here. Feeling like a sound gear. Driving towards the sun with a rose and a gun. Feel the wind in my hair. Going nowhere, I swear. Like an outlaw on the run. Dangerous, but it's so fun. Running, running, no. Hold on, don't let go. Running, running, no. Keep on, to win this game to keep their playoff hopes alive to cement their place into the finals just to kind of round out the team comps let you know who's playing what rivered on the orn in the top side egg rolls on the ball bear in the jungle Carito on the seraphine mid we haven't seen that in a while snake doctor on ezreal and ayara joan on the senna meanwhile for the iron chefs we got bartho brew on the nar in the top side king teho on the zin Zhao. Timmy on malzahar spartan monkey on Varus, and my friend told me to on the Maokai. First things this first, I just, just want to... such an 
interesting drafts from both sides. Um, you know, we had, like you say, we haven't seen the Seraphine in a hot minute. Uh, we haven't seen Jin Zhao ever, really. <laughs> so, yeah. I, Malzahar, also a very forlorn pick of the past that kind of pop, crops up in Soul Lake you every now and then and causes a lot of dismay for for those people. But overall, it'll be really interesting to see how uh, Iron Chefs actually decide to play out this game. Yeah, you see Xin Zhao clearing out that blue ward right away and then moving up to the red side, but Seraphine spots him out on a ward himself. So they are able to track the Xin Zhao bot line knows they are going to be safe for a few minutes. Yeah, we might get something cheeky though, right? Like we talked about it earlier, how there was a potential for uh, Volibear to do a, like a level two strat into the enemy jungle. But this time there is the attempt, it looks like for the Jin Zhao to potentially do that. They could go buff into Krugs into say topside, or they could even go buff topside and try and catch uh, Rivered here with a level two gank. But if that fails, it's a lot of wasted time and you do really signal yourself. Man, they're so smart. They even pinged him on the Krugs. Yeah, so they have an idea of the tracking. They didn't see him on the Raptors. They do have that ward there. So very good to assume that he is at that Krug position. And, you know, the oppressive damage from the Malkai at the very beginning with that Comet is doing some work. But they should be able to sustain that up once they get some levels in that queue. They're going to see Jin Zhao just as this ward is uh, close to expiring. There's only 20 seconds left on it, and they've, they've been able to read the entire Jin Zhao jungle. And I'm honestly surprised that girls didn't go for an invade. Yeah, and knowing that he was on the Krugs going over to steal that blue buff, slowing down the uh, clear speed would be big. But Jin Zhao loves that level 2, level 3 dueling perspective. So maybe he's just afraid of Jin Zhao. I'm not sure. I'm not a jungle main. So you guys are going to have to clear that up for me as well. But we see Xin Zhao looking for the gank on Karito. There's the silence going for it. Lands the W. Actually, it misses. He has the red buff on. Gets the knock up. Is the E going to land? Gets the double. Stunned. Flash forward. The auto attack secures the kill. And Terang gets first blood. No, honestly, I hate towers. This is so garbage. How does that tower do so little damage this early on in the game? Honestly, tower should insta-kill you before the 4 minute mark is my take. But, very clean play there coming from King to Hole and to make combo. They recognized they had the damage. The super, super late flash there from Kurito. Definitely didn't think the damage was there, but it, it was. It was just enough and it works out very well in their favor. First blood going on over to that Malzahar that does quite a bit of damage later on. Yeah, it's pretty unfortunate. Kurito getting a little greedy with the splash. Thought he was going to be able just to walk right out. The auto attack secure with the airy. I wasn't anticipating that one. Um, but yeah, overall, you know, Kurito just being greedy with that flash. Malzahar struggling to keep up with the CS. Can't really land the last hits with that dot on the cannon minions. And Kurito just doing the the best to kind of keep that lane pushed into the Malzahar and to open up space for the Volibear, but great gank from the Xin Zhao. Uh, pretty even stuff right here. We see a root land onto the Malkai. Ezreal not going to E forward as he is fighting into minion. Volibear is there in case something happens. And we're just right back on the farming. Yeah, and in, in the break period there, we were talking about what would really be the best build path here for the Senna because um, we have been seeing a lot of the grasp into Frostfire gauntlet builds that you know has been kind of terrorizing solo queue one way or another whether it's inting your team or shrekking you on the other side but this time we are going for that traditional glaciers augment Senna I think it makes a lot of sense in a lot of worlds because you are being able to slow everybody from level one from the very beginning and as somebody that's as immobile as a Varus that can really pay dividends especially once egg rolls is going to get a little bit more movement speed and be able to get into to these lanes and get a full gank off definitely with dragon spawning <coughs> at five minutes Zin Zhao looking for that early fight and again we talked about snowballing the early game pushing the pace of the game that's what Zin Zhao wants to do and Malzahar are getting close to level six so they may be looking to you know make some spicy plays happen yeah having no flash on either side does make the level six gank and bait again very feasible you can just slowly walk up as soon as you land that that um, 
lockdown. Then King Tahal just comes in, lands their set of CC as well between the slow and the knockup, and it should be a pretty free kill. And with the cooldown just halfway back on the side of Kurito, uh, they do have at least a couple more minutes where that's actually a viable strat. Oh, Bartha Brew gets the ultimate, lands Anara on the river, but here comes A Rolls looking for the flash stun auto attack. Here's the W to secure the kill, and A Rolls gets his first slay of the match. River going to be able to push out that lane. I mean, Barthur Brew thought he was going to be able to take on River, but River, cool, calm, and calculated, just kind of baits him into overextending with that Nar ultimate, and Agrils is there to secure the first kill for OMG. It was the very last of River's mana as well, so wasn't going to have a whole lot left in the tank if that didn't work out, but it clearly does. It's a kill onto the... Volibear, which we talked about last game, is a really good start. It gets you that much quicker to your next item. It gets you that much quicker into another lane, and you're able to just keep causing havoc the way you would like. And once that Volibear gets tanky, it becomes that much harder to make something happen onto him. I mean, Zin Zhao, when you're fighting, you want to be able to take people down, but if Volibear is able to get that sustained damage and get that heal off again and again and again with that fight, then it becomes that much more difficult to kind of assert yourself as a jungler. There's a flash twisted advance onto the center of the barrier, ace pop and the flash away from the piercing arrow. Here comes the uh, E from the Varus to secure the kill. He flashes forward again, but Snake Doctor trying to go blow for blow, goes forward, detonates his W, but gets caught in oh, place. He just needs one him. more auto attack. Just one more auto attack is what you need, but my friend two takes him down and Spartan Monkey and uh, my friend two win the 2v2, but here comes Egg Rolls to clean it up. He goes forward, Spartan Monkey says, I will make the sacrifice for you with my son as A Rolls returns a kill of himself. But how disappointing is that? Just one more auto attack. Oh, that is tragedy of the highest order for Snake Doctor. Just needed that one singular auto attack. Uh, look at this. We see this stun from A Rolls onto the Zin Jao. He is losing this 2v1. Gets charmed from the Seraphine ultimate. The Malzahar channel does go down, but it's not going to be enough to save his jungler. And this is where we see the Zin Zhao. If he doesn't pop off, he starts to fall off. Yeah, the ultimate there for Zin Zhao, just overall, I think it feels pretty underwhelming a lot of times. Um, but, especially, I mean, yeah, it's definitely underwhelming if you compare it to something like Samira or Gwen or Yasuo. Um, but, I mean, when he's pumping out damage, he feels really good, but that was not one of those times that was definitely one of the more underwhelming times uh, when you play Yasuo, and so the kill does go over to Kurito Seraphine, which isn't really in a carry position, right? They're much more in the supportal role this time, just trying to make sure that everybody else in the team can pop off, and every kill that they get does get them to that goal quicker, but I would have really liked to see it go over to Egg Rolls, get that third kill on the board, Kurito silenced up, but should be fairly safe. Yeah, Timmy, not having that ultimate available as he did expend it in that fight at the jungle. And, I mean, we take a look. Hats off to Kurito right now, who's almost at the precipice of getting that 10 CS per minute. But we see King Tangle finds Kurito on the way. Flash is still down. We see the ultimate from Bolivar up and over the wall, and Nar is already there. a -Rolls finds himself in a 1v3. They flash forward. They have the slow. They have the damage. And a shutdown goes on to Barfoot Group for the Nar. Teleport a little bit too late for River. And Iron Chefs making their way back into the game. The timing play there from King to Hole was really smart. You know, saw the timer on how the blue buff was going to go, was able to read the fact that Kurito was going to roam over and pick up that buff for themselves. Gets the punish there. We do obviously see the engage from Egg Rolls, who was not expecting everybody to be there, was thinking it was much more of a 1v2 situation. They both fall, give over a ton of gold, and open up the potential for something to get started on the side of Iron Chef. And this is the first time that we see the Rift Herald taken before 14 minutes. So Zin Zhao able to take that up for himself. And we'll see if Iron Chefs are able to accelerate their lead and keep their foot on the gas pedal. Yeah, you got to think about where would be the best usage of it. I think sending it mid unlocks Malzahar to crit, get into these other lanes and potentially cause a lot of problems. So I think that's obviously a really strong start. But you do kind of want to get 
you know, a little bit of help for somebody else too, right? Somebody that's on the edge of being able to start carrying. And so, you know, Bartho Brew recognizing that the Orn lane, not a ton of fun to play into. So they were started roaming around without even unlocking themselves. And look at all of this time River just getting on this top lane turret. Like River's on a tank, but they're a carry player and they've gotten two plates all by themselves. And they have a massive wave there. CS gap is ever widening. Yeah, uh, sacrificing that top lane plates for the second dragon, they really are trying to make this dragon stack happen. King Tail takes the Rift Child into the bot lane, so maybe looking to accelerate Spartan Monkey, get him a little gold for himself, or basically just trying to pin the enemy duel lane back so they can get the dragon for free, but it was already pretty much secured. Snake Doctor... It also gives two souls over to, to Senna, which is a bit of a problem. Yeah, but Snake Doctor uses the ultimate far away. Uh, my friend told me to use the ultimate to zone them off and they're going to get another play onto Varus, tanking it up yet yeah, again. I think they're afraid of the dive. Oh, they didn't they get the able to get that last plate. Three health away from getting that plate, so they're really going to do their best to make something happen. Meanwhile, Volibear is on the top side looking for Barther Brew, looking to zone him off, and we see this is going to be a dive incoming. Barther Brew has no Meganar. There's the ultimate from River. It is flashed by Barther Brew. He's doing his best to live, but that turret is disabled, and they're going to take him down. Egg Rolls gets his third kill of the game, and this Volibear is starting to pop off. Yeah, that's very, very, very bad for the side of Barther Brew. Gives up the kill, gives up the tower. And look at this. Holy! Brew. CC City onto all of them. My friend told me he goes very deep. The piercing arrow is going to land from Spartan Monkey, so he returns a kill. And my friend told me to start walking away, but Snake Doctor not going to miss the auto this time. Senna flashes away and lands the root. Snake Doctor gets on top of him and lands the kill for himself, picks up a double in the bot lane, and they are starting to extend their gold lead. 2,000 gold, and all across the map, I think it's a win pretty much in every lane. They were so set up to start succeeding there. They used the Herald down bottom, they got the plates, they got the dragon. They were able to force the bottom lane of OMG off of the tower and get a little bit more action. They over aggressed for that potential final plate, didn't even get it first of all. And then when they were finally shoved back, instead of taking that recall, they think they have enough damage there to take out the entire bot side between Kurito Snake and uh, Ahajon. But there just wasn't enough damage. The healing and shielding coming out from Senna Seraphine, just too much to deal with. And we get a slow in. Oh man, they're so close to taking out Tame. Yeah, we see the flash R from the Nazar, not the flash, excuse me, but Egg Rolls goes forward and picks up a kill for himself. And King Tail not going to be able to answer this Ball Bear who was massive. Five and one, and Egg Rolls has taken off with this game in his hands. Egg Rolls is winning the game solo at this point, and I, I said it very early in Champ Select. The Volop Hair is such a smart pick because it gives you so much to work with here, and that's exactly what's happening. Bartho Brew used the Gnar ult, but it didn't hit him. I think he was still unstoppable from the Bellows Breath? Yeah, that is correct. He was unstoppable, didn't time it correctly. And just to kind of chime back in on that mid lane fight, um, you know, when Malzahar started walking up, Seraphine was walking back, so they knew Jin Zhao was in the area. And then Seraphine walked back up, knowing that Volibear was coming and baited out the ability so Volibear can pick up that two for one. Remember, Seraphine is not your carry, it is to enable the team around you. And if you're enabling a Volibear that's five and one, he becomes super oh, no. scary to deal with. But he's caught oh, off. No. Change of corruption lands on him. I thought it was going to go wide, but here comes Team Kayle. He follows up, gets an ultimate, and Volibear ults over the wall and is able to escape by the hair of his chinny chin chin dragon spawn is not for another minute and a half so he's gonna probably have his ultimate back by then and they're gonna be able to follow up with that fight uh, it's 114 seconds currently is the cooldown there um so just on spawn it won't be available and we see river looking for the ultimate himself nar is brittle river steps up gets the auto attack and the grass proc Barthur Brew really struggling in this matchup, a 35 CS deficit, trying his best to impact the map, but River is just putting the pressure on again and again. Yeah, people think that Nar is a really good uh, counter into the Orn because it, it it makes sense on paper, just because of like we talked about in Champ Select, there's the you know percent health damage, he's very active, he's very mobile, but Orton just doesn't really care for <laughs> a lot of matchups. He just 
shows up, does Orn things, and if it works, great. If it doesn't work, who cares? He's Orn. He's going to eventually scale up into those ornaments. But he, he really outputs more damage than a lot of people still expect, it seems. And you can really catch people off guard with it. And that seems to be what's going on right here, where Bartha Brew wasn't ready for the particular matchup. I mean, look at the build already. We got the Iron Spike Whip, plated steel caps into this Hearthbound Axe, and it's so... It's such a disparity between, on the other side, you have that Sunfair Keep already completed, the Plated Steel Caps, and that Bramble Vest. And a lot of that is off of the CS differential. We talked about how much time Bartho Brew spent on this bottom half of the map. And that whole time, they weren't farming. Like, they were taking Dragon, they were roaming around looking for picks, they were, you know, getting a cup of coffee. Like, they weren't farming. And so now they're down 30 CS, down a billion plates as well as the first uh, Tower Gold. And overall, it totally amounts to 1,400 gold between the two top players. It doesn't really make too much of a difference. A lot of teams will give up the first two dragons in favor of you know getting the rest of their leads across the rest of the map. Gold is the important thing. River maybe looking to 1v3 as he's used the ultimate, the call of the Forge Gods. Volibear is looking for the flank on the backside. He has the ultimate available. He's walking into Timmy, who gets some damage over time onto him, and the team might be chasing a little too far. Agro's just chasing them all back. Fear the bear. Um, Iron Chefs do get a tower for themselves in the bot lane, but we see the entire team of OMG in this top side looking to push down on this outer turret. Inner turret, too. Yeah. Not sure about this one. Wave clear is quite okay. Oh, and they land the root onto Timmy. He is able to flash the ultimate from the Seraphine and Agrils just taking up the tower left and right. A big shutdown onto the Gnar. Gonna see Bartha Brew get back into the game. Overall, a one for one. And the bot lane from Iron Chef still in the bot side of the map. Orn is over there, but they're gonna give up this inner tower and just create more pressure for Orn to just push him way forward. So that doesn't feel worth it to me in full honesty i mean yeah you got the tower and went one for one but you gave up that massive shutdown on egg rolls and so yeah it works but i feel like it was a bit of an overreach and if they get caught here it's going to be only worse for wear and they could potentially get caught out they have this chase and it's just eating up time delaying backs like forcing you know a later recall onto the rift and so you know, they are going to spend some gold, which is great for OMG, but they're going to lose damage here. And it's up to Egg Rolls to stop the whole tower from going down, but with the Herald play, he doesn't stand a chance. Exactly. And that whole entire time, Spartan Monkey was in the bottom side of the map, just farming while the rest of the team committed everyone to the top side. So, Varys amassing a little bit of a gold lead, going for the Powers Claw yet again. We questioned that last time, but here's the College of Forge Guards. Gets oh, that's Riddle onto the Varys, gets the knockup. Senna cannot follow up, not in range for the root, but they're looking to just power down this mid lane turret. Minions are going down. Bolivar does not have the ultimate available. Huge chain of corruption, and even though he was unstoppable, he ended up slowing himself into the tower, not able to look it down. Ezreal just missed with his Q, and so far a one for zero on the side of the Iron Chefs. The tower just hanging on with a sliver of health. They really want to knock this tower down, and they're going to be able to do it with the auto attack, but I'm not sure it's worth giving up his life for that. Yeah, they gave up their top laner. They're giving up bot lane as well. It's a huge amount of gold going back on over to Bartha Brew, who, you know, is still down 40 CS, but every little bit counts from here on out. And so, you know, they do overreach a little bit for that mid tower, not respecting the wave clear that's available between the Varus and the Malzahar. It's it's a lot, right? It's it's lethality Varus. They can very quickly decimate the wave. And I mean, look at that damage. Holy. Yeah, it feels bad to get hit by that. They do have the enchanters to kind of heal him up. I was afraid for Kirito's life right there if he got hit by that arrow. With how much damage um, Spartan be able to bring out. So much damage from the lethality build. Yeah, plus you do get that percentage from the active W as well. So it's uh, it's an additional nine. Wait, no, I think that's the passive portion of it. They change active. 12% missing health up to 22% missing health. So it is an execute. It hurts a lot. You don't want to get hit by it. And Dragon is in a minute with, you know, one each team having dragons. But, you know, we're still waiting for the Iron Chefs to be able to close out 
and get another soul for themselves. They were able to get the first soul of the night, and then we never even made it to the soul in game two. It just ended too quick. Indeed, we do have the dragon coming up in about a minute, so teams are going to move into the bot side to set up their vision. Barthur Brew in the top side does have teleport available. Warren does not, so he needs to be there first, and he is. But Rivers gets a big knockup on the Spartan Monkey. But it makes him brittle, but gets hit by the chain of corruption. Is no longer unstoppable. Uses cold. The force guard flashes forward. Gets the auto attack and secures the kill on the Spartan Monkey. King Tao is there to get the follow up kill. So that is a one for one. But they're missing the carry. Flash forward from Egg Rolls. Locks up Malkai. My friend told me to. Taking up so much damage. Huge arcane barrage or true shot barrage from the Ezreal, takes him down two for one so far on the side of OMG. Unstoppable from Bolo Bear, disables the turret, flashes onto the Malzahar, goes forward, big ultimate from Senna, but no one's following up Egg Rolls, but Timmy goes down and gets chopped to pieces. He actually used the ultimate there for a second and it was immediately clicked out of, so I definitely think a bit of a misclick there from Timmy, but regardless, huge, 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 Huge W there for the side of OMG. They get the tower, they get a bunch of kills, they get the dragon on top of it. They're just growing that damage difference so much further every time they pick one up. 4% attack and ability power uh, every single Infernal Dragon from here on out. And they're already a quite high damage composition as you saw. I mean, Rivered being able to kill an AD carry. In the mid lane, Chain of Corruption misses, forces the flash out of Kurito. Actually, no flash extended. He was able just to walk out as King Kehol misses the W. Senna gets the slow with that Glacial Augment, and then here comes that Malkai who is not tanky at all. True Shot Barrage and the, um, the ultimate from the Seraphine takes him down. Two for nothing right now. Tine flashes forward looking to get the follow up kill, but he's not in range to get his dot, and Orn picks up a double kill for himself. Three for Didn't zero. Even have the ultimate. OMG is just going to walk it over Ooh, to the Baron. God. Ooh, ouch. I don't think ouch. they can. I think the damage from Spartan Monkey is honestly too scary for them to go for this Baron in any real sense of the word, but uh, we do get the teleport in here from Kurito, so they might be able to heal up from that. Uh, they might they might need it, honestly, because, like I said, Spartan Monkey is pumping out a bunch of damage. Bartha Brew has the Gnar available, but not a lot of Mega left. So it should just be the Baron, I think. Yeah, but look at that heal coming out of Kurito and the Senna. They're able to make it happen. Rivered makes Nar brittle. He's able to get the slow. The knockback from oh. the Malkai disables the second part. That was a great play from him. But Rivered with the auto attack just pops the tree. Egg rules is going forward. Uses the ultimate is unstoppable, but Spartan Monkey gets the blast cone out. And OMG are moving at a thousand miles an hour right now they have their foot on the pedal they want to accelerate this game and they have their eyes on the final using the baron empowered minions they're pushing down the mid lane yeah it took them a little bit longer than game number one but they finally accelerated that lead that they were able to gain for themselves and a lot of it is off the back of this top jungle duo rivered and egg rolls have been playing out of their minds the last two games and it really shows it impacts the map as a whole Carito, snake doctor are able to just sit back and do their job because they can recognize that the top half of the map is doing theirs as well keeping them safe and you know making sure that they're drawing a lot of power uh, resources from the iron chefs and so you know to didn't get a lot of help this this uh map spartan monkey didn't get a ton of help uh in the bottom lane either and so even king to hole you know this is definitely not exactly a stellar showcase here for the Jin Zhao, but I mean, they're trying and they're, they're being active. It's just that Fall Bear does so much more in terms of a team fight situation. And with the rest of the champions that were available, Udyr was still up, Rumble available as well. So the Jin Zhao in terms of the meta, a little bit of an awkward pick, but you know, we talk about comfort being above everything. They push the Nar oh, back geez. and then moving their way down through the mid lane, ultimate just goes a little bit wide. We see the flash ultimate from the Seraphine is not going to land, but they're moving forward onto the Malkai who has to use the nature's grass to slow down the fight. Tower is going down very slowly as Bolivar goes unstoppable, gets on top of Spartan Monkey, call the Ford guard, secures the kill for himself. Sinjog goes forward, answers one back, and the team fight is breaking out. This may be the game. Sinjog is doing so much on the back line. But it is just healed up over and over again. Timmy is back, uses the ultimate, but Maokai is taken down. And just like California, the tree goes down. 
That looks like it's going to be an ace for OMG. And with 20 second death timers, Baron Empowered Minions, they're going for the Nexus Towers. And that's going to be the series as OMG is going to secure their place in the finals of the Rampage League. Yeah, I, I was trying to see how many souls that Senna ended the game with, but she's dead. And for some reason, that means I'm not allowed to spectate her. 101 is the final count on the Senna souls as we do see Spartan Monkey trying to, to, to hold the base, but it's just simply not, a, is, is it not enough? No, it's not enough. Okay, <laughs> I was getting concerned for a second. But yeah, I mean, the way this series worked out, it definitely showed that the better team won, I would say. I think OMG really looked strong these last two games. And, you know, game two was a little bit less dominant, but they weren't as kill hungry champion wise. And so they were just able to really showcase what the composition wanted to do. And because of the champion picks on the side of IC, they just didn't really have a proper response. And that is correct. Um, you know, the off meta things was a little bit of a head scratcher, but we saw. OMG were in the driver's seat in game one and then lost that mid-game team fight. So once they were able to kind of clean up their communication, able to focus in on their team fighting and their target selection, you saw they just come out such a different team in games two and three. And they really made a difference as that series went on. So being able to adjust and adapt, uh, that was great. You saw different kinds of drafts um, from bands from the Iron Chefs. They tried something different. They tried letting the victor through. Then they had to ban it back over again. Um, you know, looking at this Varus build with that Serpent's Fang, I mean, it still did a lot of damage. I mean, me and you saw from how far away how scary it was for the Seraphine and the Ezreal, but that sustain was just too much. Yeah, and you know we did see the difference in Prowler's Claw versus Duskblade uh, between the two players, Snake Doctor and Spartan Monkey. And I definitely think that the Duskblade would have been a bit more useful. But overall, I think the Varus just kind of got run over in this last game here between the uh, Orn and the Volibear. Just too much to handle for that. Such an immobile carry. And so, I mean, that is going to be a 3-0 victory here uh, in favor of... Uh, you know, OMG here. And it was a really, really strong showing at the end. They just needed a little bit stronger of a start, I would say. Yeah, needing to really use that proactive start. Zen needed to be in the lanes over and over and over again, needed to unlock the Malzahar. I mean, you saw that game was pretty close in the first 10 minutes. That was basically where Iron Chef struggled in the earlier games, but they kept it close, but they overstepped just uh, one too many times. And then OMG was able to take that lead and run with it. That Volibear just did so much work in games two and three, but ultimately OMG able to take the victory, secure their place in the finals. And I believe the finals is going to take place next week. Am I correct? Correct. All right. So still waiting to see who's going to win on the other side of the bracket, but OMG with this strong performance, they are ready and they will be waiting so far still undefeated for this rampage season. And it's going to be a great event for us next weekend. So before we wrap this up, Doctor, do you have anything that you would like to tell our viewers? Uh, slight correction. According to the document here, we are wrong about it being next weekend. I apologize. Chat uh, does see here that the grand final best of five between OMG and To Be Determined uh, is actually June 5th. So uh, other than that, though, I do want to give a shout out to the chat for sticking with us through the night, even with some of the situations and, you know, unfortunate side effects we had for the 10 nights. But overall, it was a great series. I loved being here with you guys and everybody in behind the scenes, keeping the show going. And I'm very much looking forward to who is able to be crowned the champion here in the Open Dominate. That is correct. Um, I also want to say thank you to everyone who's doing the work behind the scenes. I mean, myself and Acolyte, and doctor are here, but in the background, uh, we have people in production. We have uh, the great Fireball, who is our stream tonight. So we got to give him a round of applause for the camera work and for fixing those audio, audio difficulties earlier on in the match. Uh, big shout out to all the administrators who put this on and for putting this all together. And it's all going to come to a fire conclusion. That's going to be a breathtaking final in a couple weeks on June 5th. Make sure you guys are here with us as we see who is going to be crowned the Rampage champions. Make sure you guys follow the channel so you are there with us. Stick around for the announcements in the Discord. But for myself, Akali, and for my co-caster, Doctor, we want to say thank you again for being here. Good game and good night.
Take a moment right here Feeling like a sub gear Driving towards the sun With a rose and a gun Feel the wind in my hair Going 